Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's seventh meeting of 2018. There are no apologies. Uh, agenda item one is consideration of an affirmative instrument, which is the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, consequential and supplementary pro supplemental provisions order 2018 draft and I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and her officials, Paula Stevenson, Tribunal, Tribunal's Policy Branch, Jerry McLaughlin, Court's Judicial Appointment Branch and Samantha Rohr, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. Um, I refer members to paper one which is a note with, a note by the clerk and Minister do you wish to make a short opening statement? Yes thank you convener good morning. Uh, the uh, Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014 Consequential and Supplemental Provisions Order 2018 makes consequential and supplemental amendments to primary legislation and uh, I understand in fact that the DPLRC considered this order on 6 February and that no points were raised. The order covers two principal areas. First, further to section 130 of the Court Reform Scotland Act 2014, the mechanism for the Scottish Tribunal Service to join the Scottish Court Service was provided for. This then became the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. As a result of that transfer, amendments are necessary to make uh, in effect the payroll function, that is the payment of remuneration, fees and expenses, the responsibility of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service rather than uh, Scottish Ministers. This order facilitates that by making amendments to various acts to allow the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to make payments to members of the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland, to Justices of the Peace and to members of the Scottish Tribunals. The second uh, area covered by this order uh, makes provision for the remuneration of temporary sheriff's principal by adding them to the list of judicial officers which Scottish ministers may determine the amount of remuneration for. This is to take account of the possibility that a qualifying former sheriff principal might be appointed on a part-time temporary basis as a sheriff principal and of course would need to be paid a daily fee. Whilst this eventuality has not yet happened to date, it is considered appropriate to rectify the anomaly whereby there is lack of any provision set forth allowing the payment of such a uh, qualifying uh, former sheriff principal. And so to rectify this anomaly and include uh, the possibility of making a payment in such circumstances, it has been seen uh, appropriate to include this judicial office within the relevant list of judicial offices as set forth. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Do members have any questions or comments from the Minister? No, that being the case, agenda item number two is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The delegated powers and law reform committee have considered and reported on the instrument and have no comments on it. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate if that's necessary. The motion is motion. 10335 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014 consequential and supplemental, supplemental provisions order 2018 draft be approved. Minister to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you. Do members have any comments or questions? Um, that being the case, uh, the question is that motion 10335 in the name of Annabel Ewing be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are all agreed. That concludes consideration of the instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Are members content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft report? Content. Thank you. Agenda item number three is consideration of an affirmative instrument, which is proceeds of crime. Can you need to suspend for oh yes, apologies. Need to spend for a, a change of witnesses. Way ahead of myself this morning. Got lots.
Question number three is consideration of an affirmative instrument, which is Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, searches under Part 5, Constables in Scotland, Code of Practice Order 2018 draft. I again welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and her officials, Alistair Creerer, Organised Crime Unit, Alan Nicholson, Proceeds of Crime Act Policy Advisor, and Carla McCloy Steve Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk, and Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you, uh, Convener. The Draft Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 searches under Part 5, Constables in Scotland Code of Practice Order 2018, is consequential on sections 14 and 15 of the Criminal Finances Act 2017. These provisions expand the civil forfeiture regi regime under Part 5, of the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. The Scottish Parliament consented to those provisions being made for Scotland on 2nd March and 25 April 2017. As they extend constable search powers under Part 5 of the Proceeds of Crime Act, the Scottish Minister is required to make new codes of practice in relation to the exercise of those powers in Scotland. The order therefore proposes to bring into operation a combined code of practice for the exercise by constables in Scotland of the search powers conferred by sections 289 and section 303C of the Proceeds of Crime Act. Section 289 of the Proceeds of Crime Act allows constables to search individuals, premises and vehicles for cash which is obtained through unlawful conduct or which is intended for use in unlawful conduct and which amounts to £1,000 or more. The combined code of practice revises and replaces the existing code of practice for cash searches as section 14 of the 2017 Act I referred to a moment ago widens the definition of cash to include, at the request of the Scottish Government, gaming vouchers, fixed value casino tokens and betting receipts. This order therefore revokes the order which brought that code into operation. Section 303C of the Proceeds of Crime Act is a new provision added by section, seven, uh, section 15 of the 2017 Act. It confers equivalent search powers on constables in respect of certain listed assets which are obtained through unlawful conduct or are intended for use in unlawful conduct. Listed assets are precious metals, precious stones, watches, artistic works, face value vouchers and postage stamps. As with cash searches, a minimum value threshold of £1,000 applies. The search powers under sections 289 and 303C of the Proceeds of Crime Act are subject to certain conditions and limits, and their exercise generally requires a sheriff's prior approval. As they are essentially the same, it was considered simpler and more effective to issue a combined code of practice to ensure that searches for cash and for listed assets are carried out appropriately and fairly and with integrity and respect. The combined code is largely modelled on the code of practice on the exercise by constables of powers of stop and search of the person in Scotland, which came into effect on 11 May 2017. The Proceeds of Crime Act specific aspects of the combined code also align with the equivalent codes issued by the UK Government under Part 5 of that Act. This is to ensure greater consistency of practice and in turn to secure public confidence in the use of search powers under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, do members have any questions or comments for the Minister? Minister, I don't know if you're aware the, law, the committee has received a submission from the Law Society of Scotland um, raising two points, basically, on accessibility and uh, monitoring and review. And basically, I think they're saying in terms of accessibility that the code needs to be available and accessible in all formats and languages to ensure the principle of diversity and equality and um, also that they do repeat the same point in paragraph 37 that um, the paragraph does not clearly recognise there is a need to respect and ensure the interests of certain specified categories of persons who may be subject to access a search um, what might be better, they're saying, is to state the principles of interest of justice test rather than appear to be rather restrictive. In other words, I think that any category should be illustrative and uh, more, a more wide um, definition in it. Happy to give the Minister this submission. It's maybe something that you could look at um, later to, to address. Uh, there's an overlap 
riding interest of justice in uh, test that is in the wider uh, than just those specified, but I think they're aware that they are intended just to be illustrative. And if I could give the second point, which is a lot easier to understand, that the Law Society considers that the code should be subject to a review of how it's working. Yeah, I thank you, Convener. Obviously, if the Law Society had seen fit to, uh, to have the courtesy to submit uh, their submission to the government, we would have been in a better position to respond, obviously, to those questions this morning. Perhaps I could ask Mr. Creator to say a few words. In receipt well, of it, Minister. We proceeded with the consultation and we did indeed pick up on certain uh, points that were raised in the consultation. Sorry, I, I thought this was a new submission that you had just received this morning. I didn't realise it was the submission that they had made to the consultation, which we have picked up on. Perhaps Mr. Creer can further advise. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Um, yes, I think, I mean, it sounds certainly very similar, convener, to the submission that we received from the Law Society of Scotland. We'd be, we'd be keen to have another look and check uh, if there's any additional points, but we uh, officials certainly considered the points made by the Law Society of Scotland very carefully, um, including the the interest of justice point. But we felt that the uh, that the the draft code, you know, set out the key uh, parameters and and values that constables should be considering. Uh, so we didn't uh, we didn't accept that point. Um, in terms of accessibility, I think, yeah, as you said, the Law Society had suggested that the code should be translated into uh, different languages and, and different formats. I think we had some sympathy for that point, but also in, uh, we were conscious that the code is above all is a code for constables. Uh, what, what we've tried to do, uh, working with Police Scotland and with other key stakeholders, in including equality groups, is make it as clear as possible uh, and as and available online and in police stations and in ports as possible so that uh, if people have been searched, they can consult the code and they can uh, share it with advocates or legal advisors uh, and get advice on that. So we, we feel that we've, uh, that we've reached the right balance on that or we've achieved the right balance on that. Uh, so we, we noted the point, but uh, we felt the law societies were, were suggesting a step too far, perhaps. Um, and in terms of the law society's point about reviewing the code, uh, we've accepted that point and we've been in touch with Police Scotland about that uh, to, to suggest that a review of the use of the code and the, and the, the working of the code uh, further down the line would be valuable. I think that would strike the light balance then and you could see if there were any adjustments. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions, Liam Kerr? It's just on that point, actually, Convener, because uh, thank you for that clarification, but that clarification entirely predicates upon the, uh, this Law Society submission being the one that you've already seen. Uh, the, the substantive question that I was going to ask was, have you seen that Law Society representation and... Uh, I noted in your comments that uh, following the few representations that had been made, you have modified the draft where appropriate. So th the question I was to ask was, have you modified your draft pursuant to the Law Society's representations? And the answer seems to be possibly if these are the same representations. They are, the same representations. They are definitely. Yes, yeah, clerks have in just confirmed case. that. So. We're all happy. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? No comments? Fine. Agenda item four is consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered the, and reported on the instrument has no comments on it. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate if necessary. The motion is 10337 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 Searches under Part 5, Constables in Scotland, Code of Practice, Order 2018, Draft be approved. Minister, to move the motion. I moved. Thank you. Uh, do members have any comments or questions? No, that being the case, then the question is that motion 10337 in the name of Annabel Ewing be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
We all agree. That concludes consideration of the instrument. The, the committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Are members content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the draft report? Agreed. Thank you. Suspend briefly to allow change of witnesses. Agenda item five is consideration of the offensive behaviour at football and the threatening communications repeal Scotland bill at stage two. I would ask members to refer to their copy of the bill and the marshalled list of amendments and groupings for this item. And once more, I welcome Anna Bechel Ewing back to the committee, Minister uh, for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and her officials. And welcome James Kenley, the member in charge of the bill um, to the committee and his supporters. Right, I think we just move straight now to the marshalled list and the question is, the very first question is section one, um, is that section one be agreed? Are we all agreed? Agreed, thank you. Section two, effect of repeal on uh, offences occurring before repeal. Call amendment one in the name of the minister grouped with amendment two, three, five, six, seven and eight. Minister to move and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, amendments one to three and five to eight adjust sections two and three to deal with human rights issues in the current drafting of the bill. The amendments in group one are intended to ensure that persons cannot be convicted or punished for an offence under the 2012 Act after it has been repealed. This is to ensure that the bill respects the principle of lex mitior, which is guaranteed by Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Lex mitior is the principle that a person should benefit from the application of the more lenient law where the law has changed before a final judgment has been reached in criminal proceedings. Ministers are of the view that the principle applies in the context of the repeal of the offences in the 2012 Act. Section 2, subsection 3 of the Bill as it stands provides that after repeal of the 2012 Act, a person can still be convicted of an offence under the Act where there is an appeal against acquittal. Section 3, subsection 2 of the Bill as it stands provides that the 2012 Act continues to have effect after repeal for the purposes of imposing a penalty on a person and for the purposes of an appeal or a petition to the nobile officium. The fact that a person can still be convicted and punished under the 2012 Act after its repeal goes against the principle of Lex Meteor and therefore raises human rights issues. Amendments 1 to 3 and 5 to 8 deal with the human rights issues by removing sections 2, subsection 3 and subsection 4 and section 3, subsection 2 and subsection 3 of the bill. Amendment 1 amends the bill to remove the reference to section 2, subsection 3 in section 2, subsection 1. Amendments 2 and 3 make amendments to section 2 of the bill so that it states that despite section 17 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010, on or after the repeal date, a, no person can be convicted or found to have committed a relevant offence, and b, 
no penalty may be imposed on a person in respect of a relevant offence of which that person was convicted prior to the relevant date. Section 17 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010 would otherwise allow a conviction and penalty, penalty to be imposed after the repeal, so these amendments oust that. Amendment 5 amends the bill so as to remove section 2, subsection 3 and subsection 4, meaning a person cannot be convicted of or found to have committed a relevant offence on appeal against acquittal. Amendment 6 amends section 3, subsection 1 of the bill so as to clarify that a person who has had a penalty imposed on them prior to the date of repeal for a relevant offence is still liable to that penalty. Amendment 7 amends section 3, subsection 1 of the bill so as to remove reference to section 2, subsection 3. Amendment 8 removes sections 3, subsection 2 and subsection 3 of the bill the result being that the 2012 Act will not have effect after its repeal for the purposes of imposing a penalty on a person in respect of a relevant offence of which that person was convicted prior to appeal, nor for the purposes of an appeal, nor for the purposes of a petition to the Noble Officium. In light of these amendments, there is no longer any need for Section 3, Subsection 3. I move Amendment 1. Thank you. Anyone else? Liam Kerr? Sorry, Liam McCarthy. <laughs> Looking at Liam McCarthy. Sorry, voice again, Liam um, Sorry, Liam. Uh, not at all. Thank you, uh, Convener. I think on the basis that I, I, I may come to be critical of the government's approach in relation to um, later amendments, it's probably appropriate to acknowledge and welcome the approach taken in relation to these amendments. I think the Minister set out very clearly uh, why they're necessary. Um, we're all conscious of the, the need to retain um, compliance with ECHR, and therefore um, I think amendments uh, one and the others in this group uh, are to be welcomed. So, thank you. James Kelly. Uh, yeah, thank you, Convener. Just uh, briefly, um, I, I want to indicate I'm supportive of all the amendments uh, in this group. Uh, as the Minister has outlined, they seek to address uh, any potential human rights issue, and they do so um, by taking the relevant sections out of the bill. Uh, I think these are helpful amendments, and I want to thank the Minister for bringing them forward today and indicate full support for them. Thank you. Uh, the question, uh, Minister, to wind up. Uh, yes, thank you, Convener. Uh, I, I welcome the, the support that's been expressed thus far, and uh, really the, the overarching consideration here is to ensure that the repeal bill is uh, uh, com compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights and uh, the, the various amendments that we have made seek to ensure that very thing. Okay. Uh, the question is, therefore, that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We all agreed. Call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1, uh, one Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. All agreed. Call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1 Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. Uh, the question is, Amendment 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Are all agreed. Um, Group 2, ongoing proceedings, conviction for alternative statutory offence. Call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister and a group on its own. Minister, to move and speak to Amendment 4. Uh, thank you, Convener. Amendment 4 inserts new subsections 2A uh, to 2B into Section 2 of the Bill. This amendment expressly provides that in proceedings for an offence under the 2012 Act that have not been determined by the date of repeal, the Court has the power to convict the accused of a different statutory offence where the facts proved in the proceedings amount to that different offence. This means that a person charged under the 2012 Act can still be convicted of a serious offence after repeal where the facts proved in trial amount to that offence. Under the current law, prosecutors can amend the libel so as to substitute an alternative common law or statutory charge for a charge under the 2012 Act. The court can also convict a person of a common law offence where the facts established amount to that common law offence. However, the court does not have the power to convict a person of an alternative statutory offence unless the charge made against them has been amended to libel that statutory offence. So, this amendment gives the court a narrow power that it currently does not have to convict a person of an alternative statutory offence on top of the existing power that it has to convict of an alternative common law offence. I move Amendment 4. Okay. Any questions? Uh, 
I would imagine, ministers, at the case that the, this would be a, a finite number of, of cases affected by this. Um, there will be so many in the pipeline not connected, and at some point of time, then these will cease to be. Yes. Yeah. It seems a sensible approach. James Kerr. Oh, sorry. sorry Daniel. Daniel. So I'd just like to, um, to also ask uh, if these uh, amendments fail to go through, the, whether or not there would be anything preventing uh, uh, the authorities to bring forward um, revised charges. Um, and this is, uh, uh, I mean, I take it there would be nothing that would prevent that. Um, no, the, I think the issue, principal issue here in terms of the, the actual substance of the amendment is uh, to reflect circumstances where it may not be possible now to amend the libel because if you could have the time to amend the libel, you could deal with this issue. It's circumstances where that would no longer be possible for various technical reasons, and it is to give this, uh, op this uh, op option to the court in the, as the convener has said, the narrow uh, circumstances that will prove to be the case. Okay, Liam MacArthur. Thanks, Convener. Just following up on Daniel Johnson's uh, question, obviously, um, I, I, assuming that this legislation, this repeal bill, passes at, at stage three, um, possibly next month, and maybe uh, slightly later, there will also be a gap between then and, and royal assent. I, assuming there's a fairly limited number of cases, given the time that's now available, what, what would impede um, uh, the, the, the libel? Um, being amended in this interim period to ensure that uh, any cases that, that need to be adjusted, uh, adjusted uh, can be adjusted. As I say, it seems to me that the, the number of cases is likely to be relatively um, small that fall within this and that wouldn't be captured by um, the court being able to proceed under common law uh, provisions. Could I maybe ask uh, officials to deal with that very yeah. technical point on circumstances where uh, Take into account. I'm afraid at this stage you can't. Oh, I can't ask. Right, that's why the official was looking Sorry. at me askance. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I would imagine that indeed the member is correct to say that there will be a limited number of cases. I think it is to ensure that there is an option available in circumstances where, for, for, for whatever reason, it has not been possible to amend the libel, and there could be a number of reasons for that. And it is to ensure ultimately that the people who have. Uh, committed uh, a, a serious offence do not escape punishment and I'm sure that we would all wish to support that. Minister, objective. I should say you can confer with your, your well, officials if that would be helpful but we can't ask them directly. I see. Okay. He's agreeing with me. So <laughs> <always> <laughs> fine. Uh, Liam? So could I just come, uh, come back on that? Now that I know you can confer with officials, um, that, that, that's also helpful. Um, Again, as I said, the, the, the time frame between now and, and Royal Assent and the implementation of, of, of this repeal, act is, uh, repeal bill um, is, is a number of months. Obviously, the direction of travel of Parliament has at least been signalled. Uh, I'm just wondering to, to what extent this is uh, addressing a, a problem that doesn't exist. I mean, I know that a precautionary principle should generally be adopted in, in such circumstances. So I'm just wondering um, whether we're dealing with a problem that has already been addressed by people who've anticipated um, uh, such a, a, an issue arising and therefore have taken steps to avoid it. Well, I, I think it, um, the, the fact that there is already this power in the part of the court to substitute in terms of common law offences suggests that there will always be circumstances that this, the exercise of this power as far as common law offences is required to be an option for the courts. And I think, therefore, in the same vein and using the same logic, there could well be circumstances where it is necessary to seek to substitute a statutory offence. And I think uh, I take in, into account the, the points the member has made. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, surely we, we want to ensure that uh, if people have committed a serious offence, that they are brought to justice and do not escape punishment. Uh, and this allows the court to... Uh, to have a belt and braces approach to that. And if we didn't have this amendment, then there would be uh, 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 potentially uh, uh, the uh, inability of the court in sp specific circumstances in a, in a time limited period to, to do the necessary. So I think it is a belt and braces approach to ensure that the court has the options open to it that it needs. And obviously after a certain period of time, this will not be an issue in terms of offences under the 2012 Act, assuming that the parliament uh, votes to repeal. Yeah. James Kelly. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Convener. Uh, I'm not convinced of the arguments in favour of uh, Amendment 4. I think the, the Minister is seeking to uh, enshrine a power that, as the discussion has uh, transpired, uh, she doesn't actually uh, require. 
Um, I also think we need to be careful in terms of ensuring a consistent approach in this Act, or in this Bill, I should say. Um, in the previous set of amendments, uh, we, 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 we tidied up uh, the, the uh, appeal provisions um, because of a potential inconsistency between uh, what could be dealt with uh, after repeal and what could be dealt with currently. Um, and this seems to be going back in that we're, we're, the Minister is seeking a power to amend uh, charges uh, after the repeal bill has been passed. Um, I also think, I would also point out, I think that prosecutors um, should have been adopting a, and should continue to adopt a pragmatic approach uh, in relation to potential prosecutions under the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act. Parliament did signal as far back as November 2016 that it was supportive of uh, full repeal, so prosecutors you know, should have been aware of that uh, and should have been adopting a pragmatic approach. So uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would oppose uh, adoption of this amendment. Minister. Uh, <coughs> Is this to respond to Mr Kai specifically or to wind up? To wind up. To wind up, okay, thank yeah. you. Um, well, well, thank you, and I've listened to the, the comments raised. Um, firstly, perhaps just dealing quickly with Mr Kelly's uh, latter points. Of course, um, the, the Act still remains on the statute book, uh, and, of course, Parliament is still to vote to repeal uh, or not. So I think we have to deal with the laws as we have them. The Act is on the statute book. Also, I would say, of course, that the government has no... Uh, jurisdiction over the Crown in terms of charges brought. That is a matter for the independent uh, 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 Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Services, I'm sure the member is uh, aware. Um, as I had previously stated, I believe it is essential to ensure that those who have committed a crime do not escape punishment because the 2012 Act is repealed. We need to ensure that the courts have adequate powers to achieve this and that in proceedings for an offence under the 2012 Act that have not been determined by the date of repeal, the court has the power to convict the accused of a different statutory offence where appropriate in the way that it currently would in terms of substituting a common law offence. I, I believe, convener, this is simply about ensuring that justice can continue to be served if the 2012 Act is uh, indeed repealed. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 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 We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Are there any abstentions? No, that's as the voting is. Yes, eight in favour, three against. Um, amendment four is therefore agreed. Call Amendment five in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment one. Minister to, for to move formally. Formally moved. Yeah. The question is that Amendment five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 6, 7 and 8, all in the name of the Minister and previously debated. Invite the Minister to, um, to move Amendment 6 to 8 on block. Formally moved. Right. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendment 6 to 8? No. Um, if no uh, the question is therefore that Amendment 6 to 8 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that section three be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that section four be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Right. Um, group three, commencement, repeal of section six, offence postponed for 12 months from royal assent. Call amendment name, uh, sorry, amendment nine in the name of the minister, grouped with amendment 10 and 12. Minister to move amendment nine and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Amendments 9, 10 and 12 adjust sections 5 and 6, which deal with the date of commencement for the Bill. The Bill currently provides that repeal of the 2012 Act will come into force on the day after Royal Assent. The effect of Amendments 9, 10 and 12 is to delay the commencement of the repeal of the Section 6 offence by 12 months from Royal Assent. When combined with Amendment 11 in Grouping 4, which we will come to shortly, the amendments also delay the commencement of the repeal of the Section 1 offence by two months. This 12-month delay for the Section 6 offence would allow the Scottish Government to respond to the concerns of organisations representing minority communities by preparing a new bill 
to reinstate the provisions of the Section 6 offence of sending threatening communications in order to maintain the protection that these provisions offer and also to consider what improvements could be made to the offence, such as expanding the range of groups covered by incitement to hatred and considering whether the, the threshold for convictions is too high. Amendment 9 amends the definition of the relevant date in Section 5 of the Bill so that it takes account of the different commencement dates for the Section 1 and the Section 6 offences that would result from these amendments if passed. Amendment 10 amends Section 6 of the Bill to confine the existing default commencement provision so that it applies only to the repeal of the Section 1 offence. Currently, the Bill provides that the default commencement provision for the Bill is for it to come into force on the day after royal assent. But our Amendment 11, which we will come to shortly, would, if agreed, change that so that the default commencement is two months after royal assent. Amendment 12 provides that the Bill, so far as repealing the rest of the 2012 Act, that is the Section 6 Offence of Sending Threatening Communications, comes into force at the end of the period of 12 months beginning with the date of royal assent. I move Amendment 9. Okay. Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much, Convener. This is, this is where I start to get a bit grumpy. Um, let me firstly say that, um, as far as I'm aware, the email the committee uh, members received yesterday afternoon at 4.30 indicating that the government's response to our Stage 1 uh, committee report had uh, been made available uh, via the website at that stage. I mean, I really think, uh, in terms of custom and practice, um, that sort of uh, turnaround time um, is, is inappropriate and far too uh, short. I think in relation to these amendments, the Minister will recall that um, during stage one I did at least acknowledge, uh, I think we all acknowledge that section six um, uh, presented a, a, a very different set of circumstances to sections uh, one to five, uh, in that section six at least had the benefit of being um, cast uh, uh, across the entire uh, population potentially, rather than targeted at a, a single uh, group uh, in relation to uh, football supporters. Nevertheless, uh, despite that, and, and despite assurances that um, your door was uh, always open, um, we're presented with uh, the amendments uh, in relation to, to Section 6 uh, and explanation of them um, now, but no attempt really between Stage 1 and Stage 2 to come and discuss with opposition members uh, what the government's uh, intention was, which appears effectively to be um, to uh, hold on uh, for 12 months till you can reinstate these same uh, powers again. I, I don't really accept that there is uh, a gap in the, the law that would be created. I think the government is still um, perfectly um, able, uh, and I'm sure will uh, choose to do so, uh, bring forward a bill uh, in the near future um, to, to reinstate these uh, provisions. Uh, but as I say, I think uh, as much as anything, I'm more than a little disappointed by um, the way in which the government's gone about um, trying to deal with this. I, I, as I said, uh, the approach in relation to the amendments in the first grouping, I thought was a very constructive engagement uh, to address legitimate concerns in relation to this uh, bill. I think the approach that's been taken in relation to Section 6, uh, however, falls uh, far short of that. Uh, so I will not be supporting the amendments in this group. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Grosjean. Uh, yes, I suppose I take the polar opposite view to, to Liam MacArthur, because to me this is, I think, the amendments that uh, the Minister is putting forward are vitally important here, because that was something we really teased out in the Stage 1 debate. And I would disagree with Liam MacArthur to the extent that there is going to be a gap in the law. We heard that in the evidence directly to the committee. We heard from the Crown Office three specific areas uh, where there would be a gap in the law if this is repealed. And I think we need to be able to have that time to make sure that there isn't a gap in the law in terms of those provisions. And we heard some examples during our evidence as well. And I really don't think that's an area that we can, that we can let go. And none of the concerns that were expressed in the stage one debate were actually addressed during that debate either. And I think we need to take the adequate time to make sure that we address all the concerns raised in this specific section um, and, and make sure that we do it right. And that's why I'll be supporting the amendments. Uh, anyone else got comments? M uh, Rona Mackay? Yes, just to um, really back up what my colleague Mary Gouchong said, I think it's eminently sensible to have this delay, uh, given the importance of Section 6, and I think it will fill the gap until the new uh, bill can be brought, a new bill can be brought in. Ben McPherson. 
convener. Again, I'll be supporting these amendments for similar reasons. It was almost unanimous in our stage one evidence that the uh, repeal of section six would create a gap in the law. There was some debate around other sections of, of, of the 2012 Act, but section six, it was almost unanimous that the repeal of that would create a gap in the law. And for the reasons uh, in terms of the stakeholders who, who were concerned about section six, I think this is a, a very sensible approach to, to look to preserve uh, the, the section six until a replacement can be found. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else got comments? My only comment is, uh, Minister, that I didn't accept there was a gap in the law and therefore I consider that the bill should be repealed in its entirety. Section 38 has been brought forward of the Criminal Justice uh, Licensing Act as an alternative. And also there's the real concern that the bar was set so high with intent being the test that it was very rarely used. So I certainly wouldn't be in favour of these amendments. Um, James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, can I first of all just address this issue about the gap in the law in relation to Section 6? Uh, I don't agree with the point Ben McPherson made where he, he tries to imply that that was almost universally accepted in the evidence to the committee. It wasn't the view of the Law Society and it wasn't the view of Professor Leverick. However, I do accept that there was... Sure, yes, Liam. I thank, very, uh, thank James Kelly. I think the point Ben McPherson was making was that the committee was unanimous, but I think, as the convener has pointed out, um, she disagreed with it. I would accept that the committee was unanimous in accepting that Section 6 presented a different set of circumstances to Section 1 to 5, but that is not the same as accepting that um, the committee unanimously um, felt that there would be a gap in the law with repeal of Section 6. So, um, I hope that clarification is helpful. I thank uh, Liam MacArthur for that uh, intervention. Um, I was going on to say that uh, I think th 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 this was uh, discussed at the stage one debate, uh, and I thought Marie Goujon made um, you know, some cogent points. Um, I did, after that debate, go back and reflect on some of the arguments that have been made, uh, and I looked seriously at this issue as to whether there actually was a gap in the law. Um, in discussing it with the Law Society, the, the specific issue Mary Goujon raised was in relation to sentencing powers for Section 6, where uh, you know, cases can be brought forward and people can be sentenced up to five years, whereas under the Communications Act that provision uh, didn't exist. But in discussion with the Law Society, it's been pointed out that uh, a section, section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act can uh, take forward cases in relation to indictment when sentences up to five years in relation to threatening abuse. And there is case law that backs this up. Um, HM Advocate uh, versus McGinley is a, uh, a breach of the peace on indictment. The second point was on uh, in cover in relation to crimes of religious hatred. Uh, it's also relevant to point out that a religious aggravation can be added to the section 38 as was the case in Love uh, versus Procurator Fiscal, Pro Procurator Fiscal of Stirling. So I've seriously looked at the issues that were raised in the stage one debate, but I'm now content that there's not only legislation in place, but there's actually case law that backs up that there is not uh, a gap in the law. And this, in fact, was a point made by the Law Society and Professor uh, Lerwick uh, in evidence. In terms of uh, the the Minister's point in relation to protection of minorities. The reality is Section 6 is an unused prov provision. There was only one prosecution in the last year that statistics are available. So I don't think it's correct to try and uh, advance an argument that says that the, the legislation offers protection to communities when it's unused. So therefore, yeah, I'll take an intervention, Mr McGregor. Okay. Would they accept that the committee heard a lot of evidence from other sources, including the Crown and Prosecution Service, that there, there would be a gap in the law, and also in relation to protected groups and minorities, that a lot of these groups came to committee and told us that they felt Section 6 was a protection? Uh, well, in, in relation to protected groups, for the period that the legislation has been in place, there have been uh, 4,655 uh, uh, prosecutions in relation to uh, hate crimes in relation to sexual orientation. Only eight of those uh, were under the, 
the, the offensive behaviour at Football Act. And as I said, there was only actually one prosecution, uh, sorry, only one conviction in the last year. So section six uh, is an unused provision. In relation to the points that the Procurator Fiscal Service raised about the gap in the law, I've substantially gone through why I believe that there is um, legislation and actual case law in place which deals with the, the, the point about the gap in the law. There's not a gap in the law. Um, and I don't, I don't believe that proper protection can be given to minorities for a piece of legislation that's not been used because the legal threshold uh, is too high. Uh, and I would uh, oppose the amendment on that basis. Okay. Minister, to wind up. Hey, thank you, convener. Um, I would say that there's absolutely no question about the fact that there would be a gap, and I think we just need to look and remind ourselves of the evidence of uh, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, where they clearly indicated what the actual factual position was, and of course the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service are dealing with these matters day in and day out. Firstly, uh, of course, um, the repeal also of Section 6, without allowing any time for the government to mitigate the impact, the negative impact of that, would take away from Scots law a specific statutory offence of incitement of religious hatred, a specific statutory offence. It would take us backwards, not forwards. It would put us out of kilter with the rest of the UK. That uh, 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 threat uh, uh, was responded to very strongly by a number of organisations of which the committee will be well aware. Uh, so Equality uh, uh, Network Scotland, Stonewall Scotland, Victim Support Scotland, Scottish Women's Convention, the Church of Scotland, the Council of Jewish Communities uh, in Scotland, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, 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 and uh, to name but some, and very serious concerns about this issue. Also, the Crown Office pointed out, of course, that um, the Section 6 provision allowed extraterritorial effect. It's certainly, yeah. I think the Minister, and, and she's absolutely right about the evidence we heard from a, a range of groups, and I think it's why um, uh, all of us were seized of the need to approach Section 6 and the repeal of that uh, in a different way in which we approach the uh, a repeal of a potential repeal of Sections 1 to 5. Uh, but it's also incumbent upon us um, to test the evidence we hear um, against um, what appears to be uh, the case in practice. And I think, as James Kelly has, has highlighted uh, in discussions with the Law Society through the statute provisions exist and, and, and precedent, there appear to be protections there. And therefore, the concern that was being expressed most um, vividly by um, the, the range of, of organisations she's referred to was about the message that is sent out um, that repeal would, uh, would remove the protection. And is she not then complicit in reinforcing that message that somehow there's a gap and there'll be an absence of protection that, as James Kelly has pointed out, will not be the case because of the other provisions that are in place and the precedent that exists? Uh, no, I don't accept that. Section 38, that sh which has been referred to of the, uh, the, licensing, the Criminal Justice Licensing Scotland Act 2010, it does not provide a statutory offence of stirring up religious hatred, and it is simply wrong uh, to say that it does. I, I think it's important to perhaps remember also uh, a, a very specific example that the uh, evidence uh, session with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service threw up, and I quote uh, from that uh, session, if I may convene it, Section 6 also provides for greater sensing powers than those in brackets, the Communications Act 2003. We have had a case in which an accused person posted comments that were supportive of a proscribed terrorist organisation, ISIS, and the view of the sentencer was that the severity of those actions should be reflected in a starting point of 24 months imprisonment. That starting point for the sentencer would not have been available in the alternative charge under the 2003 Act. I think that uh, states the position very strongly indeed. Yes, Mr Kelly. Yeah, but the, the, the facts of the matter are that in relation to Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act, uh, that provision for sentencing does exist and for bringing forward a relevant charge in relation to threatening communication. So although the example the Minister's quoting uh, comparing it to the Communications Act is valid. It's not valid in relation to Section 38 of the Criminal Justice Act. It doesn't, sorry, Ms. Kelly, Section 38 does not contain a specific statutory offence of incitement of religious hatred. That is the key issue with Section Can 6, and that is why all these uh, equalities bodies, well, as I would like to just finish my point, all these equalities bodies and, and, and certain faith bodies as well 
put forward the very, very strongly held concerns, and I'm not compl complicit at all, Ms MacArthur, in stirring up concerns. I am saying it the way it is, and as a responsible Scottish Government Minister, I am doing my best to mitigate the negative impact of this move uh, and to ensure some continuity uh, of protection. Mr Kerry. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I mean, just for the record, again, as the Law Society have pointed out, uh, a religious aggravation can be added to the Section 38 offence. So that gives the cover in relation to religious hatred and deals with, I think, the arguments that the, the Minister is trying to submit. Uh, well, I, I, as I say, what we have at the moment is a specific statutory offence of incitement of religious hatred. What Mr Kelly is proposing to do is to take that specific offence away from Scots law uh, and put, put us... Uh, out of kilter with the rest of the UK, and indeed would be a step backwards, in my view, not a, a step forwards. Uh, convener, just to, to wind up, perhaps I think we've had a, a very uh, good and thorough uh, debate. Uh, the 12 months that we are seeking to ensure this continuity of protection, I believe, is entirely reasonable. 12 months is not plucked out of the air. Uh, I think somebody referred to earlier uh, the, the fact of, uh, you know, alternative legislation could just be drummed up just like that overnight. That's not the case. We have had advice such that it would probably at the very earliest be a period of 12 months uh, that would be required to uh, come up with an alternative legislative provision to deal with the Section 6 circumstances uh, and of course therefore uh, that we would be narrowing the gap where there is not this continuity protection by at least 12 months if this uh, amendment uh, were to be uh, agreed to. Uh, uh, and ultimately, I would say that in response to Mr MacArthur, Lee MacArthur's point, that actually my door has been open from the outset, but sadly, nobody, but nobody has sought to come through my door. And finally, I would certainly... Yeah, yeah just taking you back. So it, it now transpires that the amendments 9, um, 10 and 12 in this section aren't about uh, avoiding a gap being created that we have um, a disagreement whether or not it exists, but about narrowing the period over which a gap will um, uh, will be there in the, in the law. That your, your argument is that at the very least 12 months would be needed. Um, so what, what you're saying is that these amendments won't actually do what it is that you're intended uh, attending um, should, should happen as a result of them, which le leaves the committee in, in, in a position, I have to say, scratching our heads. Maybe that you want to bring these back at stage three, but it seems that you are not in a position um, to, 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 I think, convincingly argue for them here at stage two. Well, I, I would say to, to Lee MacArthur that um, uh, the position is that we are trying very hard to respect the will of Parliament whilst acting as a responsible government. We accept that if we had come forward with a provision today dealing with a specific issue, seeking for this provision to remain in place for two years or something, that that would have been anathema to the committee, uh, or at least some members of the committee. And so what we were trying to do was to have a reasonable position. What, was the, uh, what is the period of time at the very earliest that could be required to come up with alternative legislation 12 months? And we would work very hard indeed to ensure that we met that. Uh, so that is the position of the amendment. If we had come forward with a much longer period, I'm sure Mr MacArthur would have come up with other arguments uh, against that as not respecting the will of Parliament. So we are trying to respect the will of Parliament. We are trying to mitigate the negative impacts on some of our most vulnerable communities and ensure continuity uh, of uh, protection. And I would simply conclude, uh, convener, by saying I really believe that it is simply foolhardy to repeal Section 6 without putting an alternative in place and allowing us, through this amendment, to ensure that continuity of protection. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. All those in favour, please show. All those against? Are there any abstentions? No. Five, four, six against the um, amendment nine is not agreed. The question is that section five be agreed. Are we all agreed? Section six, um, call amendment 10 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment nine. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favor, please show. Those against? Right. Again, it's um, 
five in favour, six against. The amendment is not agreed. We now um, move to commencement of um, commencement of generally postponed for two months um, Royal Assent Grouping 4, call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, in a group on its own, Minister to move and speak to Amendment 11. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 11 adjusts Section 6 of the Repeal Bill, which deals with the commencement date of the Bill. Currently, the default commencement provision in the Bill is for it to come into force on the day after Royal Assent. Amendment 11 changes this so that the bill would commence at the end of the period of two months beginning with the day of royal assent. An implementation gap of two months between royal assent and commencement is, of course, the normal standard practice. The reason why an implementation a gap of two months is the normal standard practice is that the date when royal assent is received is not easily predictable. Therefore, linking commencement to a specific period after royal assent provides for greater predictability as to the date of commencement, which in turn uh, provides certainty and time for all of those affected by the bill to take account of its provisions and make all reasonable adjustments at, that are required of them before the date on which the new legislation comes into uh, force. I move Amendment 11. Any members wish to speak to this? James Kelly. Thank you. Uh, I, I would seek to oppose this amendment. Um, I think it, essentially, if you look at the, the timetable in here, I think it's important to understand that uh, if stage three, obviously scheduling a stage three is a matter for the Parliamentary Business Bureau, but if stage, stage three was to be considered before the end of March, the, the normal, well, you can't be exact, the normal time period uh, between passing a stage three and uh, Royal Assent is around two months, which would take us to uh, the end of May, which is crucially the end of the football season. So in actual fact, post that, there still is a, a two month period uh, for, for prosecutors and police to carry out any prepared work that the, the minister uh, argues is necessary. Um, so I don't actually think this amendment um, is necessary. I think I've argued throughout the process of this bill that the legislation uh, has been discredited. Um, it's you know, been argued against not only by supporters but also legal experts. And as, th as such, um, I have sought to repeal the legislation as quickly as possible. And I don't support the, the amendment that the, the minister brings forward. Minister, to wind up. Hey, thank you, Convener. Seeking the two-month period from Royal Assent is not odd or unusual. It is, in fact, ensuring that the bill is brought into line with accepted, tried and tested practices. Until the Stage 3 debate has been concluded, it is perhaps slightly presumptuous to assume the outcome. Therefore, those affected by the, the changes in the law need time to take account of these changes. The date of Royal Assent is not certain, so a two-month period will give everyone a clear date to work to and ensure the orderly uh, management and administration of our justice system. It is our aim to ensure that any transition from the current legal framework to a new set of circumstances is achieved as smoothly as possible. And it is right that organisations upon which this change will impact have time for a period of adjustment to ensure that their houses are in order and ready for the implementation of the change on a fixed and clearly identified date. The fact that the repeal bill is taking away legislation rather than adding it does not make any difference to the fact that those who need to take account of the changes need time to make sure their policies, procedures and operations are amended in good time to fully enact the new legislation from the day it does come into force. As the date when Royal Assent is given is never certain, it is entirely reasonable that those who need to prepare for the repeal can work to a known date and have due notice of it. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We're not all agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Five in favour, six against. The amendment is not agreed. Call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 9. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? 
Um, five in favour, six against. The amendment is not agreed. The question is that section six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are all agreed. The question is that section seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I just now suspend briefly to allow for a change of witnesses.
Next item six is consideration of the civil litigation expenses and group proceedings Scotland Bill at stage two. I'd ask members to refer to their copy of the bill and the marshalled list of amendments and groupings for this item. Uh, for the last time today, I welcome uh, Annabelle Ewing, Minister of Communi uh, for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and her officials. And now we move straight to um, the amendments. Group 1, Success Fee Arrangements, Claims Management Services, call Amendment 18 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 18 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, at the outset, I would wish to refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest, wherein they will find that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, that I hold a current practising certificate, albeit that I am not currently practising. Amendments 20 and 22 are intended to clarify that the provisions of Part 1 on success fee agreements apply to claims management companies as well as to solicitors as providers of relevant services. Concerns have been expressed that this was not clear. There are a wide range of different ways in which claims management companies operate or may operate in future, sometimes in association with firms of solicitors. It is claims management companies rather than law firms who are currently offering damages-based agreements in Scotland, though the bill now provides for solicitors to also offer damages-based agreements. The approach taken is to define success fee agreements as agreements for the provision of relevant services rather than just relevant legal services, and to define that master concept as including legal services and claims management services respectively. Amendment 20 also defines legal services and defines claims management services in a similar way to section 419A of the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, which is to be inserted by the Westminster Financial Guidance and Claims Bill. It seems appropriate to draw on the definition of claims management services that will be applied by the Financial Conduct Authority which the Parliament has agreed through a recent legislative consent motion should be the regulator of claims management companies in Scotland in the near future. The definition of claims management services includes advising claimants as to funding options, for example, success fee agreements or commercial funding uh, for commercial cases. It also includes services in relation to legal representation, which means getting everything in place in terms of paperwork and witnesses so that when the case is handed over to a lawyer, the amount of time and cost spent by lawyers doing non-legal work is minimised. The purpose of Amendment 20 is to ensure that Part 1 applies to claims management companies. However, Amendment 20A, in the name of Daniel Johnson, amends the definition of claims management services in Amendment 20. This would mean that only regulated claims management services are caught by the definition. It would mean, therefore, that the provisions of Part 1 on success-free agreements would not apply to claims management companies as providers of relevant services until claims management companies are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. In other words, it would not stop claims management companies offering success-free agreements in the regulatory gap. Instead, it would negate Government Amendment 20, which brings such companies within the ambit of Part 1 of the Bill. So, uh, they would have a free-for-all, because none of the restrictions and protections under Part 1 of the Bill would, in fact, apply. It would mean, in particular, that claims management companies would not be subject to the cap and success fees, which will be brought forward in regulations. Whilst I understand Daniel Johnson will not have intended this amendment to have that effect, if the inspiration for the amendment was to be clear that providers of success fee agreements would all be regulated persons, I'm happy to put on the record that a provider of a success fee agreement under the government's amendments will either be a regulated law firm or a regulated claims management service provider once the Financial Conduct Authority assumes its full rather than its transitional powers. For this reason, I ask Daniel Johnson not to move Amendment 20A. Amendment 65, in the name of Gordon Lindhurst, delays the commencements of Parts 1 to 4 of the Act until claims management companies are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Members should be clear that the amendment would not delay the commencement of COCs only, but every single provision set forth in Parts 1 to 4 of the Bill. There is a balance that needs to be struck between the benefits of increased access to justice and the risk of increased unscrupulous operations of claims management companies in Scotland during the so-called regulatory gap. The Scottish Government does not consider that there will be a flood of rogue claims management companies moving north from England in the period between commencement of the provisions of Parts 1 and 2 of this Bill and the commencement of full regulation by claims management in Scotland by the FCA. Sheriff Principal Taylor was quite clear in his evidence that he did not believe uh, that this would happen. Although there will be a gap between implementation of the Bill and full FCA regulation, the gap is expected to be relatively short. Also, 
There have been certain developments, of course, since uh, stage one. Specifically, the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill, as now amended and going through the House of Commons, has transitional clauses that will give the FCA uh, the uh, power on a transitional basis to obtain reports, information and documents from claims management companies, companies operating in Scotland in advance of full commencement of the FCA's regulation. Further, the UK bill has also recently been amended to ban cold calling for claims management services and this provision is to apply in Scotland. In fact, I wrote to the convener on 8th February about these important amendments uh, at uh, the Palace of Westminster and hopefully that is information that all committee members have had an opportunity to look at. Although this does not mean immediate regulation, the FC will FCA will be able to clamp down on errant companies the moment regulation starts. Any rogue companies contemplating a move to Scotland will know that regulation is coming and that any such operations will be short-lived. Any delay to implementing the civil litigation bill will delay its access to justice benefits to anyone in Scotland contemplating civil litigation. Kim Leslie, the convener of the Civil Justice Committee of the Law Society of Scotland was very clear that the Law Society did not want to delay implementation until there is full regulation of claims management companies in Scotland. Gordon Lindhurst will be unsurprised to hear that I am unable to support his amendment to delay commencement of all of the substantive provisions of the bill until FCA regulation of claims management companies is in place. Uh, first, uh, uh, this does not take into account the latest developments that I have referred to in some detail with respect to the amendments to the UK Financial Guidance and Claims Bill. And second, to do so would be to delay the real access to justice benefits that this bill delivers. I again reiterate that the amendment would not only delay quarks, but would also delay the other pro provisions of the bill, such as group procedure, third-party funding, solicitors being able to offer damages-based agreements, sliding cap on success fees, and so on. Consequently, I ask Mr Lindhurst, in light of these latest developments, not to move Amendment 65. Amendments 18, 19, 21, 23, 24, 25, 26 and 30 are all consequential on Amendments uh, 20 and 22. I move Amendment 18. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Daniel Johnson to speak to Amendment 20A and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener, and I'd like to begin by saying that, that, that I tabled this amendment um, uh, as a probing amendment because I think that uh, I, while I fully acknowledge um, the, the comments that the Minister made, and indeed I, I recognise that if I were to press this that it might have consequences, I think what is important is that we do address the, the possibility of a regulatory gap uh, for claims management companies. Indeed, that was something that the Committee uh, asked the Government uh, to look at in our Stage 1 report, and I think it, it continues to be a concern. And while I fully um, recognise the point that, that in the, the, the fullness of time and as the, the, the UK uh, uh, legislation uh, comes forward, that, that that would cease to be an issue at the moment, um, that there is a gap. That's a, a gap that is uh, uh, not, not clear or certain at this point, and therefore I think it is important that the government looks at how it could uh, take a precautionary principle and provide for interim uh, regulation of claims management companies uh, in, the, in the period of time that there, there is a gap. So for those reasons, uh, I think it was important to table this probing amendment, but I also fully uh, recognise and am fully supportive um, of, of this bill. So while I acknowledge that Gordon Lindhurst's uh, amendments may well uh, be in the, in the broad, um, <clears throat> uh, same broad space and broad intent as mine, I wouldn't support delay of the bill uh, overall. So um, hopefully that e explains and clarifies my intentions uh, behind Amendment 28. Thank you. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst to speak to Amendment 65 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, first of all, I should refer to my register of interests and the fact that I'm a member of the Faculty of Advocates and a practising advocate. Um, I don't think I need to go into the detail of the actual wording of the amendment uh, in light of the fact the Minister has already covered that. The purpose of the amendment in my name is to ensure that protection for those seeking access to justice in terms of this bill uh, by regulation of claims management companies is in place before the bill is brought into force. Now, this would in particular anchor in statute in the bill itself, this committee's recommendations stated in its stage one report at paragraph 326, and I quote the committee's report, the committee considers that the bill's provisions should not be brought into force until such regulation is in place, end quote. 
Uh, the committee members will be aware that my amendment has the support of the Association of British Insurers as stated in their stage two briefing to the committee. Uh, to quote their words, I think it's worthwhile doing this, they say this would ensure that there is no regulatory gap to the detriment of Scottish consumers and safeguard against further increase in claims management companies' activity in Scotland, end quote. So I, I take on board the Minister's comments, but in terms of the urgency of bringing the provisions of this bill into force, the principal provisions, immediately, I would point out that the Taylor Report uh, was published in October 2013, so there's been a number of years quite properly in getting to this stage. Um, and in my submission, the, there's not uh, an urgency to bring the principal provisions into force immediately uh, in light of what the Minister has said about the minimal delay that this will cause. So the comment that regulation is coming uh, is not... Um, in my view, good enough in light of the minimal delay that this would cause. And I think it's important, considering that quite a number of years have been spent uh, bringing the bill to this stage, that uh, the claims management company regulations is in force and the uh, bill is brought into effect in tandem with that uh, in my submission properly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much. It seems to be a happy coincidence of timetabling that we've moved from the Offensive Behaviour at, at, at Football and Threatening Communications Act, where we were debating uh, the existence or not of a gap and, and um, how desirable it was to, to close that gap to, to this instance where the Minister's position seems to be slightly more relaxed. I think in this instance I would certainly accept uh, not only the points she makes, but the wider benefits of, um, of the provisions in this bill and, and I think the desirability of not delaying their uh, implementation. Uh, I would also, I think, acknowledge the steps that um, she and her officials have been taking um, to link in with the process at a UK level uh, to try and address the problem that was raised with us right at the outset of stage one in relation uh, to claims management companies. I think in relation to the amendments within this section, I was probably more taken by Daniel Johnson's approach to trying to address this, which um, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, he would be quite uh, happy to accept was a, an idea originally from Sheriff Principal Taylor him, himself to address that, that hiatus rather than um, the approach that, that Gordon Lindsay, I think for very genuine reasons, has brought forward. Um, I accept some of the shortcomings or the, the, the problems that are inherent in, uh, in the approach uh, that uh, Daniel Johnson's amendment uh, brings forward. But I think this may be something that we, we do need to look again at at, at stage three, just to ensure that uh, we are doing everything possible to make sure that the, the benefits of the wider bill uh, are, are delivered. But this very serious concern that was raised with us pretty much across the board and from the get-go um, is, uh, is dealt with as best as possible. I would only add, Minister, that we, we did raise the, the concern that there, there would be a period where these claims management companies were, were not covered by the regulation and the fear in that interim time that they may gravitate to Scotland as it being uh, a less, uh, uh, less stringent regime. So if you could address that, then that would be very much appreciated. Convener, um, firstly, the, the purpose of the government amendments in this group is to ensure and remove any doubt that the provisions of the bill will apply to both solicitors and claims management companies as providers of success fee uh, agreements. As I said earlier, those providers will be regulated either by the Law Society of Scotland in the case of solicitors or by the Financial Conduct Authority in the case of claims management companies. Dealing with the specific uh, points raised, um, uh, Gordon Lindhurst um, quite rightly referred to the committee stage one report, but of course the developments that I was talking about at the Palace of Westminster have uh, post-dated the committee stage one report. Uh, and so that will allow the FCA on a transitional basis to uh, uh, be able to have the power to demand information and reports and documents from claims management companies. And also, very importantly, it will introduce a ban on cold calling also to apply to Scotland. Uh, so I think, as I, as I said, it is now for us to weigh up, uh, given these uh, further uh, uh, moves to uh, ensure that claims management companies operate in a reasonable fashion, uh, uh, that we weigh that up with where we have reached, uh, and we also weigh up where we are with regard to the important provisions of this bill uh, that indeed uh, uh, emanate from Sheriff Principal Taylor's excellent review uh, dated 2013, but that perhaps would be a reason to, I would have thought, crack on and ensure that the very important provisions concerning 
as I say, group proceedings concerning uh, the fact that solicitors will be able to offer damages-based uh, agreements and not just the purview of claims management companies, uh, that there will be a sliding cap on success uh, fees uh, and, of course, qualified one-way cost shifting and many other provisions as well that we uh, allow the bill to go ahead to ensure that individuals in Scotland feel that they can have a remedy to uh, enforce their rights in terms of civil uh, litigation. Thank you, convener. Okay. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 18, Minister, to formally move. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We all agreed. Um, call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 18. Minister to formally move. Formally moved. Yes. Um, call Amendment... Yeah, there's something else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, it's fine. Yeah. Call Amendment 20A in the name of Daniel Johnson, already debated with Amendment 18. Daniel Johnson, to move or not move? I, I won't move it. Not time. moved. Thank <clears throat> you. The question is that 20 um, is that 20 be agreed to? Are we all agreed so with Mr. Yes. Minister, will you press and withdraw Amendment 20? Uh, formally moved. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, call amendments 21, 22, 23 and 24, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and invite the Minister to move amendments 20 and 24 on board. Uh, formally moved. Okay. Formally moved. Um, does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 21 to 24? No, the question is therefore that amendments 21 to 24 are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Question is that section 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Question is that section 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Right, call amendment 25 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 18. Minister to formally move. Moved. Question is that amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, call Amendment 76 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 18. Minister to formally move. Formally moved. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. We now move to Group 2, Success Fee Agreements, Exclusion of Certain Matters. Call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 28 and 29. Minister, to move uh, Amendment 27 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 27 and 29 remove the exclusion of family proceedings for success fee agreements generally. However, Amendment 28 permits a more nuanced approach by allowing the Scottish Ministers to make regulations setting out what kinds of success fee agreement will be prevented from being used in certain kinds of litigation. The Scottish Government agrees with Sheriff Principal Taylor that family proceedings should not be financed by damages-based agreements. However, Section 5 of the Bill currently prevents any type of success fee agreement from being used to finance family proceedings. Success fee agreements can be either speculative fee agreements or damages-based agreements. These terms are not defined in the Bill and the Scottish Government does not propose to introduce definitions to the Bill since, uh, in, in our view, this would add unnecessary complexity. The Faculty of Advocates submitted evidence to the Justice Committee that speculative fee agreements were sometimes, though rarely, used in family proceedings and argued that this funding option should remain available to litigants where appropriate. Amendment 28, therefore, would extend the existing power of the Scottish Ministers to provide by regulations the kinds of litigation which may or may not be financed by certain types of success fee agreements. The risk in dealing with this matter on the face of the bill is that either too many types of funding arrangements are excluded, which is what the bill currently provides for, or too few. Primary legislation could indeed prove inflexible in that regard. The approach that we are suggesting will allow for future proofing since the regulations can change as practice changes. The regulations I referred to would be the subject of public consultation before being presented to Parliament and would be subject to the affirmative procedure in Parliament. Amendments 27 and 29 remove from the face of the bill the exclusion of family proceedings. The government remains committed to prohibiting the use of damages-based agreements in family proceedings as recommended by Chair Principal Taylor, but equally is concerned to ensure that speculative fee agreements should continue to be available where these are appropriate and will assist litigants in pursuing uh, their case. These amendments will permit that to happen. 
and the expanded delegated power will ensure there is sufficient flexibility to react to changes in success fee agreement practice in uh, the years ahead. Thank you, convener. I move amendment 27. Thank you. Thank you. Any others wish to speak? Liam MacArthur? A very um, quick question. I can understand the rationale. It's helpful, the Minister, setting that uh, out further. Uh, I suppose there's always a, a slight anxiety in moving things from primary legislation off the face of a bill into, into subsequent regulation. But as I say, I can understand the rationale. Is it her understanding that the amendment will be turning to later in, uh, in the morning in relation to pub, uh, post legislative scrutiny of the bill will capture um, these provisions as well and allow us an opportunity at a, at a later stage to review how um, the, the, the provisions are working in relation to this specific matter? Yes, my understanding is that yeah. the post legislative scrutiny uh, proposals are sufficiently wide to allow a look at how the Act, yeah. assuming it's passed, is operating in practice. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Minister, to wind up, I think. Uh, no further nothing further to add. Yeah. The question is, Amendment 27 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Amend, uh, call Amendment 28 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 27. Minister to formally move. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Um, call Amendment 29 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 27. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Okay. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 30 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 18, Minister, to formally move. Formally moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We now move to Group 3, Personal Injury Claims, Use of Damages for Future Loss in Calculation of Success Fee. And I call Amendment 57 in my name, grouped with Amendments 58, 59 and 31. And um, I'll speak to these amendments and move Amendment 57 in my name. Amendment 57 ensures damages for future loss are effectively ring-fenced and cannot be included in a success fee agreement. There will therefore, they will therefore not form part of the overall damages awarded in a claim for the purpose of calculating a success fee agreement. Amendments 58 and 59 are consequential to Amendment 57. The committee heard evidence at stage one that the term future loss can cover damages awarded for lost earnings while an injured person is off work recovering, or travel expenses for expected future hospital appointments, and in more serious personal injury cases, it could cover loss of all future earnings, as well as the cost of future care and specialist equipment which may be needed. The bill currently allows for these damages awarded for future loss to be included in calculating the solicitor's fee, provided certain conditions are met. In summary, these conditions state that um, the damages are paid in a lump sum. Thereafter, if the future loss element is a lump sum exceeding £1 million, then damages will only be included if the solicitor has advised the client to accept the lump sum either and either the court where damages are awarded by the court or an independent actuary where damages are obtained by settlement has confirmed that it is in the client's best interest that the payment be in a lump sum. It's fair to say there were conflicting views from witnesses. The Association of British Insurers and the Forum of Insurance Lawyers both argued that as this money for future loss is awarded to pay the, for the, the pursuer's care and support, including accommodation and equipment that they may need for the rest of their lives, it should, it should not be included in the fee agreement. Taking the opposite position, pursuers' representatives argued against ring fencing damages for future loss, saying that they thought the bill struck the right balance between protecting the pursuer and ensuring a solicitor is paid fairly for the work involved. 
The committee in its stage one report voiced its concerns if damages for future loss were to be included. Therefore, it asked the Scottish Government to reflect on this evidence and to consider whether damages for future loss should be ring-fenced when calculating a, so a solicitor's success fee. Having considered the evidence heard from both defender and insurer uh, and pursuer representatives, I'm persuaded that damages for future loss should be ring-fenced from the calculation of a solicitor's success fee. Quite simply, this money has been specifically awarded to the pursuer for their future care and support in whatever form that may take. Some aspects may, for example, not be necessarily immediately or not, may not be necessary immediately at the time of the award, but it's evident they will be required over time. Furthermore, the pursuer's representatives can still be paid through a variety of methods, including recovering judicial expenses, claiming from any part of the ward that doesn't include damages for future loss, and looking at the possibility of claiming an additional fee in complex cases. The committee heard these fees can be in a multiple of three or four times judicial expenses. In conclusion, therefore, I believe that amendments 57, 58 and 59 not only strike the right balance in calculating a success fee, but are necessary to ensure the appropriate measures are in place to protect pursuers' entitlement for an award for future loss. And I move amendment 57 in my name. Do any... John Finney? Sorry, <coughs> Oh, sorry. Oh, amendment uh, 31, could I just say um, the definition, including that of an act rate, is something I'm in support of. Amendment 31. Minister, to speak to um, amendment 31 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. This group is about damages for future loss. I think it is important at the outset to say that we are considering people who have been victims of very tragic circumstances, who have received catastrophic injuries through no fault of their own, and that we should not lose sight of that. Section 6, subsection 4 to subsection 8 of the Bill uh, make uh, provision for the future element of damages awards. The system in the Bill, as introduced, would be a share of Principal Taylor recommended that damages for future loss would be included in the amount of damages from which the success fee will be calculated if, but only if, the future element is to be paid in a lump sum. If the future element is to be paid by periodical payment order, then it will not be included in the calculation. In other words, in terms of the bill as currently drafted, it will be ring-fenced. Following the change to the discount interest rate and in the light of the provisions of the forthcoming damages bill, it seems much more likely in the future that the element of damages payments relating to future loss will be made by means of a periodical payment order. Chair Principal Taylor considered the position in England where all of the future element of the award is ring-fenced, i.e. not included in the calculation of the success fee. The bill faithfully implements Chair Principal Taylor's recommenda recommendations on the issue of success fees and lump sum payments, uh, uh, including future loss when calculating the success fee. Alongside that, however, the bill contains a number of safeguards in section 6, subsection 5, 6, subsection 6 and 6, subsection 7. If the future element is above £1 million, the court will have to agree that it is in the client's best interest that the payment is made by lump sum rather than by periodical payment order. If the award is agreed by settlement, then an actuary would have to agree that the payment relating to future loss should be paid by lump sum. Margaret Mitchell's Amendment 57 and the consequential Amendments 58 and 59 go further than the recommendations of Sheriff Principal Taylor. Amendment 57 changes the effect of the provisions in Section 6, Subsection 4 of the Bill in relation to the calculation of a success fee. It would mean that no success fee could be taken from the future loss element of an award if it was to be paid as a lump sum. Under the existing provisions of the Bill, the future element of an award is already excluded from the calculation of the success fee if the future element of an award of damages is to be paid by periodical payment order. In light of this, and having considered the issues raised by the committee in their Stage 1 report, the Government is prepared to support these amendments, which will make the position the same when the future element of an award of damages is paid by a lump sum. If the committee supports the amendments, then the Government will consider whether any changes may be needed as a consequence and will bring forward appropriate amendments at Stage 3 if they are. 
Amendment 31, in fact, responds to concerns raised by uh, Stuart Stevenson, former member of this committee at stage one, about the need for an appropriate definition of actuary in section six. However, the intent of the amendment is overtaken, in fact, by the changes made by Amendment 58. So, uh, at this point, I do not intend to move Amendment 31, uh, convener, uh, and, of course, I wait to uh, see the result of the uh, discussion on your own uh, uh, amendments. Um, but since I will not get a further opportunity to speak in this group, I will quickly explain the intent of Amendment 31, just in case the committee votes against Amendment 58. I hope that's all clear. In his evidence, Sheriff Principal Taylor suggested that the actuary should be a chartered actuary. The amendment provides that the references to actuaries in Section 6, Subsection 6, sub Subsection B will now mean associates or fellows of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. The Institute and Faculty has advised that this approach should be future-proof, since even if the concept of chartered actuary emerges in the future, the concept of associates and fellows would be retained. So to conclude, convener, I am not moving at this point Amendment 31, since uh, the intent of that amendment is overtaken by the changes made by the convener's Amendment 58, and obviously wait to see the result of discussions on that Amendment 58. Thank you, convener. John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I wish to speak very briefly in support of your uh, amendment. And, and one of the phrases, indeed, that the Minister used there was the client's best interests. And I, I think that should be at the, the forefront of our, our deliberations. Um, it's sometimes very dry, a lot of what we do here, um, and we have to think of the practical implications of it. Now, I don't doubt for one second that the very able people who deliver these um, um, important sums of money regarding personal care and that, there will be methods for by which they're, uh, they're uh, properly remunerated, but I think it's wholly appropriate to ring fence, and I'd like to lend my support to you. Thank you. Ian McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Convener. <coughs> uh, like John Finney, I think um, we, were, we were all seized of um, uh, what appeared to be uh, an incongruity in terms of the approach in relation to lump sum payments uh, as opposed to uh, periodic uh, payments, and I certainly welcome the, the Minister's uh, agreement to accept these uh, these amendments, which I think address that concern. I, I'm slightly concerned that she's not moving Amendment 31, which I did see as an attempt to um, uh, stave off attempts by Stuart St Stevenson to set himself up as an actuary. Uh, but I'm reassured that she thinks that 58 will achieve the same objective and will therefore wholeheartedly support that uh, amendment too. Okay. Uh, and for me to wind up, um, just in response to the Minister, I note that you, you say the ban you hope that the, ban the, the damages bill is likely that that um, will cover payments for future loss being made in instalments. It's no means certain. And in the meantime, then lump sums will still be recommended and will still be awarded. Also, £1 million is a colossal amount of, of money, £1,000 is a colossal amount of money to some pursuers. And there's the danger that um, in including future loss, even for a thousand pounds, um, the, um, the pursuer would lose out. So in, on that basis, then I press the amendment. And the question is that amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are all agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 58 in the name, my name, already debated with Amendment 57, which I now move. Uh, the question is that Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. I call Amendment 59 in my name, already debated with Amendment 57, and I move Amendment 59. And the question is that Amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Call Amendment 31 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 50 since, uh, 57. Minister, formally move? Not moved. Not moved. Okay. And the question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We now move to Group 4, which is independent advice about uh, success um, fee agreements. The, I call Amendment 63 in my name in a group on its own and I'll move Amendment 63 and now talk to it. Amendment 63 seeks to address potential conflict of interest in success fee agreements. This was raised by Professor Alan Patterson during Stage 1. 
Professor Patterson stated that success fee agreements had to be subject to appropriate um, protections and that in some cases there may be a need for the client to receive advice independent from the client's original solicitor on the terms of the success fee agreement. This he considered would protect both solicitors and clients for underlying potential conflicts of interest. While this is not necessary for every speculative fee agreement and every damage-based award, there is an argument for it in some situations. Amendment 63, therefore, allows further discussion to ascertain from the Minister her views on the independent review issue and how best to ensure the necessary protections are in place. So the amendment as drafted allows Scottish ministers to make regulations for the circumstances in which a provider A must ensure that prior to the agreement being entered into, the recipient receives advice from another independent provider as to whether the agreement is in the recipient's best interest. However, I'm aware that the question thereafter uh, would be, what are these circumstances? So having spoken further with Professor Patterson since lodging the amendment, he's pointed out that all lawyers are required in good faith and in the objective best interests of their clients to act in the best uh, interests of their clients. Currently, in fee agreements regarding property transactions, transactions, if there is either an actual or potential conflict of interest, such agreements are voidable unless the transaction was fair and reasonable in the circumstances and there was no undue influence and the client gave his or her informed consent following disclosure of all the relevant facts and another independent solicitor would have advised it. These tests are applied in property cases, but not at present in the basic lawyer-client fee contact. So to ensure that vulnerable potential clients have a level of protection that success fee um, agreements are fair, I propose that these tests be applied to success fee agreements in personal injury cases. This is on the basis that a success fee agreement involves the lawyer taking a share of the client's damages, i.e. property. I, it therefore follows that in certain success fee agreements cases, uh, we need more than the normal protection in a client retainer contract. The onus should be placed on the lawyer to show that these two tests that it's fair and reasonable with no undue influence, and two, that informed consent has been met, and if these aren't met or provided, then the agreement would be voidable. So, I look forward to hearing the Minister's comments, and I would be grateful if there was a commitment from the Minister to work with me to look at these tests with a view to putting them on the face of the bill. But I await your comments, Minister. Anyone? Yeah, I move Amendment 63. Any other members wish to speak? Minister. Hey, thank you, Convener. Um, amendment 63, in your name, in terms of the way it is currently drafted, which is all that I can really deal with in terms of what's actually in front of me today, um, but it provides that the Scottish Ministers may make regulations about the circumstances in which a services provider must furnish a pursuer with advice from another independent provider before the pursuer enters into a success fee uh, agreement. I, I find it difficult to know when this check might be required, uh, and I do take into account the, what the, the convener has just said, but many providers, of course, as has been said, will be solicitors, and they are professionally required to act in the best interests of their clients at all times. It is difficult to see whether, therefore, there is any uh, need to provide the pursuer with this second opinion, if that is still what is being contemplated, with uh, attendant costs and who's to bear those costs and uh, the, the process and, and what steps would be required, how long would that all take? Um, of course, one of the overarching objectives of the bill is to make costs more predictable in terms of a uh, pursuer being able to go to a lawyer who can offer a damages-based agreement, for example, 
and no upfront costs uh, and, and so forth and, and cocks in terms of personal injury actions. That is the kind of straightforward approach of the bill and it does seem to me that this process could lead perhaps, uh, which is not the intention, but could perhaps lead to um, a, a, a more cumbersome approach for circumstances where the, 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 the solicitor is duty bound uh, in terms of the practicing certificate to act in the best interest of clients. I would say in terms of uh, the, the, this theoretical conflict that of course speculative fee agreements have been able to be offered by solicitors since I think the early 1980s and 90s, sorry, 90s. And uh, so whilst there is a, has been a theoretical conflict of interest with respect to the provision by solicitors of speculative fee agreements, um, nonetheless, that has not presented any problem in practice. Uh, and I think, therefore, we can take uh, 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 some comfort from that fact that that has been in operation for some decades now without this, uh, uh, any need for this extra additional uh, 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 process. I would also say uh, 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 to the member that, of course, the setting of professional standards rules, for example, for uh, solicitors is, of course, a matter for the Law Society of Scotland as their professional regulator, and it is not for the government to direct, and I think I made that point during the Stage 1 evidence session that I was uh, at, it is not for the government to direct the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, in terms of particular actions, of course, we can be in discussion with them and it perhaps may be, therefore, that um, the concerns that the member may have could more properly be addressed by having further discussions with the Law Society of Scotland as a regulator to see what their uh, view may be. I hope that's helpful, convener. The Minister, for, for these comments. Um, there are potential conflicts of interest in these success fee agreements and the bill as it currently stands, does not address them. I do believe that um, the two test um, provision that Professor Patterson set out in our discussions where um, the, the lawyer or the solicitor must prove that it's fair and reasonable and that no undue influence was exerted and that the client has informed consent been met. I think even Professor, um, Professor uh, Sheriff Taylor did say that that provision in particular, informed consent, would, for example, allow the solicitor to say, well, I charge X amount per hour for the following reasons. I'm aware that there are other rates available, and therefore that would um, allow um, an informed choice on the part of the client if they wanted to um, engage that solicitor or if they wanted to look elsewhere. All in the client's best interest, all in the interest of access to justice. Now I'm aware that the amendment as dressed, um, as tabled at present, does not do what I seek the um, successful fee arrangement to uh, the review of the successful fee arrangement uh, agreement to do. And for that reason, I will not be pressing it, but I will, as the minister suggests, um, speak to the Law Society, and I hope she would engage with me to um, look at what could be brought forward at stage three to ensure that vulnerable clients and others are not disadvantaged um, by success fee agreements not benefiting from the two tests suggested. Does any member object to me withdrawing the amendment? That being the case, we shall move on. And section group five, success fee agreements, multiple providers, call amendment 32 in the name of the minister and a group on its own, minister to move and speak to amendment 32. Thank you, convener. Amendment 32 is intended to address a potential problem identified by members of the committee, uh, in particular John Finney and, and Rona Mackay, during stage one evidence that attempts may be made to charge more than one success fee in relation to the same case, thus circumventing the caps to be imposed on success fees under section four of the bill. The suggestion was that a firm of solicitors and a claims management company might both take a success fee and the combined charge to the client might exceed the proposed caps on success fees to be paid out of damages awarded or agreed. 
Pursuer representatives gave evidence to the committee that this does not happen in practice. Nevertheless, we wish to ensure that this can never happen in practice. The amendment will give ministers the power to ensure, indeed, that it will not. It will allow regulations to be made under the existing delegated power in section 7, subsection 3, which will prevent a pursuer from being liable to pay two or more success fees. These regulations engage the affirmative procedure. By referring to more than one provider rather than more rather than more than one agreement, we intend to allow this to deal with cases, firstly, where there is more than one party to an agreement, and secondly, cases where there are multiple uh, agreements. In addition, you'll be pleased to learn that the Law Society of Scotland's Working Group on Success Fee Agreements proposes to develop a model success fee agreement which should make it clear that only one success fee is payable, further reducing the risk of abuse. Thank you. I, I move Amendment 32. Thank you, Convener. No other members wish to speak. Minister to wind up. No, Just for so. Okay. Question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Group 6, power to make further provision about success fee agreements. Call Amendment 33 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own. Minister to move and speak to Amendment 33. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee report on the Bill at Stage 1 expressed concern about the breadth of the power given to the Scottish Ministers by Section 7, Subsection 4 to modify Part 1 of the Bill. Amendment 33 responds to these concerns by restricting the power so that it will apply to just uh, Section 7 rather than to Part 1 as a whole. Amendment 33 also contains a further restriction so that the regulations can add to Section 7 or modify text added by the regulations but not otherwise alter it. In other words, None of the text of Section 7 that the Parliament agrees to at Stage 3 may be removed by regulations. It may be helpful if I try to explain the kind of addition or modification which is envisaged. As the Government explained in its response to the DPLRC, the purpose of Section 7, Subsection 3 and Subsection 4 is to augment the current provisions of the Bill in relation to success fee agreements, where it is considered to be desirable to have future provision about the mandatory terms of success fee agreements or their enforcement. Such provision would only be brought forward after consultation on the regulation of success free agreements with stakeholders and thus cannot be included in the Bill at present. The regulations would mean that any new provisions could be set out in Section 7 rather than set out in freestanding regulations. That would mean that all of the mandatory terms relating to success free agreements would be found in the primary legislation. I move uh, uh, Amendment 33. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment... Oh, sorry, no, there are no other members. I don't wish to make any questions, okay? Uh, the question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. The question is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Group 7, restricting of restriction of pursuers' liability for expenses in environmental proceedings. Call Amendment 60 in the name of John Finney in a group on its own. John Finney to move and speak to Amendment 60. Uh, thank you, Convener. And, and I do um, wish to, to, to speak on the, the implications of the Art House Convention, which is now 20 years old. And it's not all that intervening period I've talked about this subject, but I've certainly talked about it with frequency, both with the Minister and her predecessors, both in this position and uh, in the environmental portfolios. It, it's certainly the case that, as the bill stands, it gives personal injury cases, including those with an environmental aspect, so-called toxic torts, a qualified cost, one-way cost shiftings, um, and that's seen as a, um, a first-class protection. Um, because we, we do know that costs are a huge barrier to justice, and we also know that <clears throat> Scottish Government has consistently been criticised on its uh, um, perceived uh, failure to comply in full. Now, I accept that that's not the Government's position on this, and this amendment would go some way to addressing this, not completely to addressing this. So I'd be very keen to hear what the Minister had to, to say in, re in relation to, to, to this. Um, I'm always very keen to engage on the subject, and, and uh, I'll leave it there just now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Yes. Could you move Amendment 60? I move that amendment. Thank, thank you. you. And no one else wishes to speak, Minister. Hey, Convener, Amendment 60 in the name of John Finney is intended to give pursuers or petitioners in environmental cases falling under the Aarhus Convention the protection of qualified one-way cost shifting under Section 8. 
At present, protective expenses orders, or PEOs, limit a party's liability to pay the expenses of an opponent or third party to a particular sum, whatever the outcome of the case. This gives a degree of certainty and predictability in relation to litigants' potential exposure to an opponent's expenses. Rules of court currently regulate the award of protective expenses orders in judicial review cases and statu statutory reviews which fall within the scope of the Public Participation Directive, broadly, uh, Aarhus cases. The Scottish Civil Justice Council consulted on further draft court rules in relation to protective expenses orders last year. Following the consultation, the Scottish Civil Justice Council has set up a working group to look at protective expenses orders and we await its final conclusions and it would be premature to preempt them uh, now. Sheriff Principal Taylor, during his two and a half year review considering expenses in civil litigation, examined in some detail the need to restrict certain litigants' liability for expenses in judicial review applications, which again covers most Arhus cases. He stated that, and I quote, to an extent, the judiciary are already embracing the concept of quarks, albeit under the guise of protective expenses orders. Sheriff Principal Taylor rejected an extension of quarks to other types of case which he considered did not always involve a weak pursuer against a powerful defender. The Scottish Government considers that this argument would apply to environmental cases. For example, it may be well-funded charities, wealthy landowners or businesses that seek to judicially review Scottish, government, uh, Scottish ministers' decisions on, for example, energy uh, consents. The post-legislative review paper on the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012, which introduced quarks in England and Wales, did not suggest that quarks should be extended to any other areas of civil proceedings beyond personal injury. It should also be recalled, I think, that there has been no consultation on the matter, given that such an extension of quarks beyond personal injury claims was not a recommendation uh, of Sheriff Principal Taylor in his uh, two and a half year review. Furthermore, no environmental NGO made any submission to the consultation uh, on the bill uh, on this matter, and nor did any other respondent to the consultation on this bill suggest any such an extension of Cox beyond personal injury claims. I consider, therefore, that the best approach is for the Scottish Civil Justice Council to continue to keep the matter of costs in environmental proceedings under review as part of its civil justice remit. As I have pointed out already, Chair Principal Taylor did not recommend quarks for environmental cases or indeed any other types of civil litigation beyond personal injury actions and the post-legislative scrutiny of the uh, legislation in England and Wales that had introduced uh, quarks did not recommend extending quarks to anything other than personal injury. Further, we will come to, to debate uh, today or perhaps next week a group of amendments which will provide for post-legislative review of uh, the Bill of the Act, including quarks. Uh, and that will naturally include the question of whether quarks... Sure, certainly. I'm grateful for the Minister taking intervention. I, I, I didn't know whether you were coming towards the end, and I, I, want, uh, I wanted the opportunity for you to, to comment on the criticism that there's been, legitimate or otherwise, and how you would address that. Most recently, there was criticism. I think First Minister spoke in Paris, and there was criticism there uh, about what was seen as a, a shortfall in the Scottish uh, legal system's compliance with our house. Could you comment on that, Minister, and what? perhaps on your willingness to further discuss the matter? Um, what I would say is that I think it has been recognised on implementation of our house in general that, in fact, Scotland has made progress, uh, and I think that should be recognised. And I think, to be fair, the member did in his first uh, intervention this morning on, on this matter. And also, there have recently been certain changes to the protective expenses order regime uh, as well. Uh, obviously, for the member, those do not go far enough. But what I'm saying is that this matter is properly a matter for the Scottish Civil Justice Council, and that they are, uh, have a working group on the matter, and I think it would be premature uh, to preempt the result uh, of that. Uh, I, I think, uh, in conclusion, I would just reiterate that the consultation on this bill was not about quarks and, and environmental cases, it was about quarks and personal injury cases. Uh, no uh, respondent uh, suggested that there be an extension, and no NGO, in terms of the consultation on this bill, the one that we are dealing with before us, uh, made any submission at the time suggesting the extension of quarks to environmental cases. I appreciate the member's long-standing interest in this matter and I quite fully expect him to raise this matter with me on many other occasions and I'm always in that context happy to uh, uh, discuss uh, that or any other issue. But I would uh, ask him to consider whether he would perhaps not press his amendment uh, today to ensure that we allow the Scottish Civil Justice Council to continue with its work.
Thank you, Convener. Convener, to wind up, press or withdraw. Um, thank you, Convener. I, I, I thank the Minister for the, the comments and, and note what said. It, it wouldn't be my intention to, to press, if that's... OK. Thank you. Uh, does any member object to um, John Finney withdrawing this amendment? No, that being the case, it's withdrawn. Um, group 8, pursuers' liability for expenses and personal injury claim circumstances of pursuer and defender. Call Amendment 1 in the name of Liam Kerr, grouped with Amendments 2, 3 and 9. Liam Kerr to move Amendment 1 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I do move Amendment 1 uh, and all the amendments in the group. The amendments to, that I've proposed to Section 8.1 fundamentally boil down to what I would suggest is making the appropriate balance. Qualified one-way cost shifting is to be introduced as a means of improving access to justice. Uh, this is a good thing, uh, but it should not apply uh, in cases where there is no David and Goliath relationship. We heard a great deal about the importance of uh, mitigating any such David and Goliath relationship. Uh, and what I'm proposing is that where there is no such relationship, uh, the Quark's amendments uh, should not be applying. My view is that there is, as originally drafted, a lack of protection for defenders who are uninsured uh, and or of limited means. And therefore, it's my view that, uh, and these are the amendments I'm proposing, that Quark's should not apply where there is a funder uh, and Amendment 9 uh, clarifies what a funder would be. Uh, Cox should not apply where a defender is uninsured. Uh, it should not apply where a defender is not a public body, the person is legally aided, and or the person gets third party funding. That's what my amendments seek to achieve, and I move Amendment 1 and 2, 3 and 9 in my name. Anyone else want to speak to this? Lee MacArthur? Uh, thanks, Kevin. I'm I, I welcome William Kerr's clarification of the amendments and certainly recall the debate we had through, through stage one. Um, I suppose my anxiety around um, trying to, 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 to limit the, the Quark's provisions or where they apply in this instance is that we, I, I think, need to guard against setting uh, unhelpful uh, uh, incentives into the system, um, thereby, um, I, I suppose, in, in one example, um, providing an incentive for, for people not to, to seek insurance um, in order to escape kind of liability uh, or the, the, the prospects of, of personal injury cases being, being brought. I mean, I'll listen carefully to what the Minister has to say, but um, I think there were um, some concerns raised with us during stage one uh, about um, where we would get to in trying to define the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the provisions in the way that, that Liam Kerr um, quite legitimately sought to, to, to do. But I'll listen to the Minister with interest. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Vina. I mean, likewise, I, I, uh, I, I, I hear what Liam Kerr was saying regarding David and Goliath situations, uh, but I am worried that the, the nature of these amendments actually doesn't strike the right balance. I, I, I would question whether or not the indicators that he's using, such as whether or not um, the, the defendants have insurance or if the pursuer has uh, third-party funding, actually would, uh, uh, I, I think, exclude the, 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 the sort of the... The, the situations that he is concerned about. And in particular, I think, with regard to third party funding, I'd be p particularly concerned that that would exclude people pursuing these claims with the backing of a, of a trade union, which clearly, uh, I think, would, would not be right. I think that that, that, that is a, a relationship that is, that is useful uh, and indeed enhances, I think, the intent behind this legislation. So therefore, while I understand um, the, the intent, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, support these amendments. Minister. Thank you, Convener. During these stage one evidence sessions, there, there was some concern raised by the Faculty of Advocates and Defenders Solicitors about the operation of Cox in what was termed <coughs> excuse me, a David versus David case. In other words, where the defender was, uh, for example, ostensibly an uninsured uh, individual. And I'll return to the points that Mr MacArthur uh, made a moment ago. Amendments 1, 2 and 3 in the name of Liam Kerr attempt to address that issue but go further in a way which risks uh, in seriously undermining the operation of qualified one-way cost shifting in Scotland when it is introduced. Indeed, the amendments appear to have the intention of watering down quarks from what Chair of Principal Taylor proposed to the point it would offer little benefit to personal injury pursuers. The effect of Amendment 1 is that Section 8 would only apply if the pursuer has no funder. We wonder if this is an attempt to remove pursuers benefiting from success fee agreements from the effect of Section 8. That would be a significant departure, indeed, from Sheriff Principal Taylor's proposals, because success fee agreements and quarks were intended to be complementary measures for personal injury pursuers. 
Section 8 would also apply under this amendment only where it appears to the court that the defender is insured in respect of the claim or the defender is not insured but the Motor Insurers Bureau is liable to make payment or the defender is a public body. In other words, qualified one-way cost shifting would only be available if the pursuer had no funding and the defender was insured or, if not insured, the MIB would pick up the tab or a public body. The committee heard evidence from Sheriff Principal Taylor and Patrick Maguire of Thompson's solicitors that pursuers do not in practice sue uninsured defenders. As Sheriff Principal Taylor said, if the defender is a man of straw, the pursuer will not raise proceedings. After all, there is no point in obtaining a court award that cannot be enforced. In his stage one evidence, Sheriff Principal Taylor also pointed out some of the drawbacks of further restricting quacks, saying, and I quote, the difficulty with that is that you could end up with parties not bothering to insure themselves when they ought to, or with parties taking on a much higher excess in order to pay a much lower premium, and thereby making themselves, in effect, self-insured. He went on to say, you could find parties who have policies, so COPs would apply, but who would have breached the terms of their policy with the insurers, such as the obligation for fidelity. As a consequence, one-way cost shifting would not be available in circumstances in which it should be available. And I think that uh, Liam MacArthur was picking up on those points that he had heard Chair Principal Taylor give in evidence. Cox is part of a raft of measures convener introduced by the bill to provide more certainty about the cost of litigation for those with a meritorious claim. It makes it clear that the pursuer will not be liable for the expenses of the defender if the case is lost. Sheriff Principal Taylor quoted statistics from England where it was noted that defender insurers only claim expenses when they win cases in 0.1% of those cases. Sheriff Principal Taylor had no doubt that the situation was the same in Scotland. Amendments 2 and 9 would have similar effects in restricting quacks where the pursuer was separately funded. Uh, and I think that deals with Daniel Johnson's concern as well. The effect of Amendment 3 would be to disapply quacks where the pursuer was legally aided. It is not, however, envisaged that personal injury claimants will be legally aided if they have a success-free agreement. It is, of course, absolutely right that there should be no benefit if the claim is pursued inappropriately, and I, we will discuss shortly uh, uh, fraud and other grounds on which quacks protection may be lost. But to add these further restrictions, as Liam Kerr is seeking to do in his amendments, just adds uncertainty about cost into the process of litigation in direct contradiction to the overarching principle of this bill, which is to increase the predictability of costs of civil litigation such that we can promote access uh, to justice on the part of the citizens of this country. It will also reduce the effectiveness of the bill and will remove an essential element of the carefully constructed framework of recommendations made by Sheriff Principal Taylor. Again, I would cite the fact that Quox was introduced in England and Wales in the legislation I referred to in the previous se uh, section uh, in 2012 without such restrictions being in place. And moreover, further to the post-legislative scrutiny that was only very recently carried out of that legislation in England and Wales, no uh, uh, problems uh, in that regard were uh, identified. I would say in conclusion, uh, convener, that a number of stakeholders have cautioned against any reforms that could invite satellite litigation. And I fear that Liam Kerr's amendments could increase the likelihood of such disputes. It is for the foregoing reasons, convener, that I ask Liam Kerr to consider withdrawing Amendment 1 and not moving Amendments 2, 3 and 9. Thank you, convener. Liam Kerr to wind up. Press or withdraw. Thank you, convener. And I'm grateful to the various members for the, for the arguments made. Uh, just in response to some of the points, I think in terms of the England and Wales situation, I think I'm right in saying there are some significant differences. Uh, that's not to say that... that I disagree with the Minister, simply that I think there's more to be investigated in that regard. I think Mr MacArthur's point about the insurance is certainly concerning, uh, and the Minister made the, the point as well. Uh, and I, and I, again, I would be interested in looking at that further, although I'm not convinced it's a reason to withdraw. Uh, in response to the Minister, this isn't an attempt to remove success fee agreements, uh, although, again, I'm interested in the point. Um, the Minister points out that uh, some evidence suggested that pursuers do not pursue the uh, uninsured as a, as a matter of practice. Uh, now, whether or not that's a, a good basis upon which to legislate uh, a, a person with an interest, on which note, by the way, I declare my own interest as a registered member uh, and practising solicitor of the Law Society of England and Wales and of Scotland, uh, but I, I, the, the Minister talks about introducing uncertainty 
around cost, but arguably, if we are relying on a practice in which a pursuer doesn't pursue an uninsured, that is even worse uncertainty uh, than were my amendments to be agreed to. So I, I would like to put this to the vote, and so I will press the amendment one and two, three, and nine in my name. Question, is that amendment one be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. um, we are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three, four, and eight against. The amendment one is not agreed to. Um, call amendment two in the name of Liam Kerr. Already debated with amendment one. Leaving Liam Kerr to move or not move. Move. Um, the question is that amendment two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Move. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against. The division is 3-8. The amendment is not um, agreed. Call amendment 3 in the name of Clare. Already debated with amendment 1. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Move. Uh, the question is amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. And um, There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, um, please show. Um, the division is 3-8. The amendment is not agreed to. Right, grounds on which pursuer may be liable for expenses in personal injury claim. Call amendment 34 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendment, uh, amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move amendment 34 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Liam Kerr to speak to amendment 4. Sorry, Minister first. <laughs> Thank you, computer. This group of amendments provides for the circumstances in which the protection of qualified one-way cost shifting or COCs will be lost by a pursuer in personal injury proceedings. Amendment 34 makes it clear that failure to conduct proceedings in an appropriate manner by the pursuer's legal representative as well as uh, by the pursuer may lead to the loss of benefit of COCs. When Sheriff Principal Taylor gave evidence to this committee, he indicated that fraudulent representation involved word of mouth, but as he said, fraud can also take place through actions. This amendment faithfully reflects Sheriff Principal Taylor's suggested wording for the test of fraud in relation to quarks. It ensures that actions as well as representations will be considered by the court in deciding whether the benefit of quarks should be lost. Amendment 4, in the name of Liam uh, Kerr, is very similar to Government Amendment uh, 35, but relies on a further amendment, Amendment 5. While the Government Amendment is simpler from a drafting point of view, I think the amendments have the same aim, and I'm therefore willing to support Liam Kerr's Amendments 4 and 5, as they have the same effect as Amendment 35. If the committee supports Amendment 4, therefore, I would not intend to move Amendment 35. If amendments four and five are passed, the government will, of course, consider whether any changes may be required in terms of drafting at stage three. Amendment 36 makes it clearer that the test of reasonableness in section eight, subsection four, subsection B is tantamount to that of Wednesbury unreasonableness. The original drafting was intended to reflect the Wednesbury test, but it was clear that stakeholders wished the government to revisit its drafting approach. This amendment broadly follows wording suggested to the committee by Simon de Rolo QC of the Faculty of Advocates on 26 September. This was endorsed by Chair Principal Taylor in his evidence to the committee on 31 October. It means that any manifestly unreasonable behaviour by the person bringing the proceedings or a legal representative results in Quark's protection being lost. The concept of manifest unreasonableness delivers in substance the Wednesbury test, which Sheriff Principal Taylor said in his review had to be a high test, as otherwise the benefits of quarks might be lost as pursuers might not have the confidence to litigate. Amendment 6 in the name of Liam Kerr would mean that the benefit of quarks would be lost if the pursuer fails to beat a tender made during the court proceedings or an offer of compensation to settle made before the court proceedings start. The question of tenders, that is whether a pursuer should lose the benefit of quarks, was raised in written submissions uh, by much of the insurance lobby. Other groups who responded to the call for evidence, for example, the Law Society of Scotland and Brodie's, considered it the kind of issue that may be dealt with uh, in rules of court. I agree with Sheriff Principal Taylor that the benefit of COC should be lost if a pursuer fails to beat a tender. However, I also agree that it is more appropriate to deal with tenders through secondary legislation. Members will have noted 
that this is indeed the firm position of the Lord President, who has written to the committee very recently on uh, this issue. If, as the Lord President has indicated, tenders and settlement offers are to be dealt with in rules of court, that is the appropriate place for any provision on failure to beat a tender or a settlement offer. Section 8, subsection 6 of the Bill clearly states that Quox is subject to such exceptions, as may be, may be provided for in an act of sedirent, i.e. in court rules. The Lord President has stated that the reference to tenders in primary legislation, which would be the effect of, of Mr Kerr's amendment number six, would restrict the court's ability to regulate in this area. Indeed, it would preclude the Scottish Civil Justice Council from coming up with a more straightforward terminology, uh, uh, aside from using the word uh, tender, which uh, may have other uh, connotations. Liam Kerr's Amendment 7 is similar. The benefit of Cox would be lost if the pursuer is, in the opinion of the court, being unreasonable in refusing to accept an offer under a pre-action protocol. Again, I consider that this should be left to rules of court. Lord Carloway, the Lord President, commented in his letter to the, the convener last week that the committee may take the view that Amendment 7 would be anomalous in both its operation and in its effect. And I agree with the Lord President. Pre-action protocols are a matter for rules of court. Amendment number 8, in the name of Liam Kerr, would mean that the pursuer would be deemed to have acted in an inappropriate manner and so would lose the benefit of Cox if the proceedings are summar summar summarily dismissed by the court. I am not aware that the term summarily dismissed is in fact used in primary legislation and there appears to be some doubt about whether the court of session currently has powers to dismiss a case summarily. I am aware that the Scottish Civil Justice Council is considering this and that rules are likely in the foreseeable future. Whether those rules will use the term summary dismissal or some other phrase like strike out as in England and Wales is not yet known and again the Lord President has emphasised that the Parliament should be slow to tie the Scottish Civil Justice Council's hands. Lord Carlyby noted in his letter also that the general power of summary dismissal referred to in Amendment 8 will be considered as part of the current rules rewrite project. Amendment 10 in the name of Liam Kerr defines what is meant by proceedings in section 8 subsection 4 to the effect that it means all actions of the pursuer in a damages claim both before and after proceedings have been served. This amendment is uh, uh, unnecessary if the government amends, amendments succeed, since the phrase in connection with the proceedings will cover behaviour by the pursuer or their lawyer in the pre-litigation period as well as in the civil uh, proceedings proper. Amendments 40, 47 and 49 are consequential drafting amendments, Amendment 49 inserts a new section after section 12, which provides the definition of legal representative for the whole of part two of the bill. Amendment 40 is a consequential amendment, which removes the definition from its previous place in the bill in section nine, subsection four. The definition is not changed. This change is necessary because the definition of legal representative is now relevant to section eight quarks, as well as to sections nine, third party funding, and section 11, award of expenses against legal representatives. Amendment 47 is another consequential amendment which removes the reference in section 11 to the definition of legal representative in the now defunct section 9, subsection 4. Amendment 48 is a minor consequential amendment to the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014. It relates to section 81, subsection 5, subsection B of that Act, which provides that only in the case of unreasonable behaviour will a party lose the benefit of fixed expenses in civil procedure cases in the Sheriff Court. Amendment 17, in the name of Liam Kerr, requires the Court of Session to make rules for a new pre-action protocol for clinical negligence cases. The amendment also provides that clinical negligence cases would not have the benefit of quarks until these rules come into force. We consider that the extension of pre-action protocols to medical negligence cases is for the Lord President and the Scottish Civil Justice Council to consider. We do not consider it appropriate that there should be a delay in extending the benefit of quarks to pursuers in such cases. We do not consider that that would be in accordance with the spirit of the bill. I move Amendment 34. Thank you, Convener. Liam Kerr to speak to Amendment 4 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I, so, uh, you'll forgive me, I haven't done this before. I, yeah, so my amendments deal... Uh, as you've heard, with where the benefit of quarks should be lost pursuant to Section 8.4. And first of all, I'm grateful to the Minister for clarifying that, uh, and, and indeed I agree that uh, the Government Amendment 35 is 
or my intention in Amendment 4 uh, and is uh, in the same vein as the Amendment 35. And uh, so if, if mine is passed, then uh, I'm grateful for the clarification that 35 won't be pressed. Uh, the, the benefit of quarks should be lost where, in my view, on the balance of probability, a claimant has acted fraudulently in connection with the claim or the proceedings. And again, I'm grateful for the clarification that uh, later on it's a, a wider category uh, of proceedings. Uh, given that many claims will never reach court, the test should include the behaviours and actions prior to litigation, and because I think that will deter more spurious claims from being brought forward. Uh, this uh, accords with Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations. Uh, moving on to uh, Amendments 6 and 7, as the Minister said, uh, these rather go together. Uh, the provisions in the Bill on quarks do not take account of the tender process. Uh, tenders, as we've heard throughout the evidence, form a very par important part of this type of litigation and so it is my view that there should be a specific reference to this in the bill. Uh, if I recall correctly this was a recommendation of the Taylor report. Uh, it, it certainly Sheriff Principal Taylor stated in evidence to the committee I, I am persuaded that qualified one-way cost shifting should not be available and should be specified as not being available in the event that the pursuer has failed to beat a tender. Now at present where a defender fails to beat a pre-litigation offer, they must beat the offer at the conclusion of the action uh, or be liable for the defender's judicial expenses from the date of the offer. Uh, uh, it is my view this, this discourages uh, unnecessary litigation so that courts and parties' resources can be focused on claims which genuinely cannot be settled. But if Quark's protection was not lost, then uh, where a pursuer fails to beat a defender's tender, this would seriously undermine the tender process and dilute the current incentive to resolve cases before going to court. And so my proposed amendment uh, includes tenders made prior to the commencement of court proceedings to encourage an early settlement of claims to the benefit of the parties. Uh, in terms of my amendment eight, this was about the summary dismissal. I, so I, I don't uh, necessarily agree that it shouldn't be in there. I, what I've tried to make clear is that Quark's protection should be lost where a pursuer's claim is summarily dismissed. Uh, I think that's in line with Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations and indeed his evidence to the committee. And I think this would be a key protection against frivolous claims being brought. Uh, moving on to my Amendment 10, the Minister has clarified, uh, if, if I heard correctly, that uh, if the Government amendments are made, then there will be no need for my Amendment 10, uh, in which case I wouldn't seek to press that. In terms of my uh, Amendment 17, this is about proposing that clinical negligence claims will not fall into uh, Section 8 until there is a pre-action protocol in place. Sheriff Principal Taylor recognised in his evidence that there was uh, vital importance to pre-action protocols uh, insofar as uh, inter alia they incentivise settlement uh, and allow a focus on the claims which can't be settled by the court. Uh, members will remember that I was concerned in committee as to the cost of clinical negligence claims. And so certainly it's my view that a pre-action protocol is required before implementing uh, something, quarks, which by its own definition will increase claims. And so on that basis, I move uh, Amendment 4 and the attendant uh, other amendments. Lee MacArthur. Thanks very much. Can I start by also welcoming um, the progress we appear to be making in relation to ensuring that the pr provisions uh, do adhere to the Wednesbury principle? Um, I, I think the Minister said that Liam Kerr's amendments uh, 4 and 5 um, uh, do that. I think 36 uh, reinforces that, and I very much uh, welcome uh, the progress made there. I think in relation to the, the, the points that uh, Liam Kerr, I think, very rightly makes uh, about pre-action protocols um, and, and tenders. I read with interest the Lord President's um, submission. Uh, given that he raises questions about my own amendments, I, I, I have some reservations about uh, siding with them in this instance, but I think the concerns he raises uh, are, are perhaps legitimate. I think the point the Minister made in relation to, to orders of court, again, um, seems to be not 
unreasonable. I, I think obviously we've got um, the potential, should Amendment 55 passed for post-legislative scrutiny of this, I mean, I think there may be an opportunity there to say um, to the, uh, the Lord President and colleagues, look, there's an opportunity over the coming years to have through those orders of court and through um, subordinate legislation and addressing of the very legitimate concerns that um, not just Liam Kerr, but Sheriff Principal Taylor uh, made. Um, and, and I think maybe if the Minister in winding up could, could uh, be more explicit in that regard, it would give some of us that have uh, comfort, uh, that have sympathy with, with what Liam Kerr is trying to drive at through Amendments 6, 7 and 8, um, that uh, actually these will be addressed, um, not just in the fullness of time, but in, in, a, in a time span that um, I, I think recognises the, the, the importance of getting this right. Minister, to wind up. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, as I said, I am happy to support Liam Kerr's amendments 4 and 5, but I cannot support his other amendments in this group. I appreciate that the provisions of Section 8 of the Bill do not include, on the face of the Bill, some of the criteria which Sheriff Principal Taylor recommended should lead uh, indeed, to a person losing the benefit of qualified one-way cost shifting. However, as the Lord President has clearly indicated in his letter to the committee, matters relating to tenders, settlement offers, pre-action protocol, summary dismissal are much better dealt with in rules of court, and that indeed is the normal uh, practice, and I do hope that the committee uh, agrees with the view of the Lord President in that regard. Uh, responding to Lee MacArthur's point, uh, I, I am fairly confident that if the provisions on post legislative scrutiny, which are particular to, the, to this bill, and we'll get on to that when we get to that section, but I'm fairly confident that that perhaps will serve as a spur uh, to action uh, in perhaps a timetable that was maybe not the initial timetable scheduled. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, call Amendment 4 in the name of Liam Kerr already debated with. Amendment 34, Liam Kerr to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 35 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 34. Minister to move or formally to move? Not moved. Not moved. Okay. Um, the question. Yeah. Call Amendment 5 in the name of Liam Kerr. Already debated with Amendment 34. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Move. Move. The question is Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Call Amendment 36 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 30, uh, 34. Minister to move formally? Formally moved. Yeah. And the question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Uh, therefore, there will be a division. And um, those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. And eight for three against the uh, amendment is agreed to. Call Amendment 7 in the name of Liam Kerr already um, debated with amendment. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Call Amendment 6. Sorry. In the name of Liam Kerr already debated with Amendment 34. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Move. Move. Uh, the question is Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. No, we're not agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, uh, three in favour, eight against, the amendment is not agreed. Amendment, call, call amendment seven, name of Liam Kerr already debated with amendment 34, Liam Kerr to move or not move? Move. Move, the question is amendment seven be agreed to, are we all agreed? No. no we're not all agreed, there will be a division, those in favour, please show. Those against. Three in favour, eight against. Amendment is not agreed. Amendment eight in the name of Liam Kerr already debated with. Amendment 34, Liam Kerr to move or not move? Not move. Not move. The uh, you're right, not moved. Uh, call Amendment nine in the name of Liam Kerr already debated with. Amendment one, Liam Kerr to move or not move? Uh, move. Move. The question is Amendment nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Not all agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? Three in favour, eight against. The amendment is not agreed. Call the amendment 10 in the name of Liam Kerr, already debated with amendment 34. Liam Kerr to move or not move? Uh, forgive me, convener, can I have some clarification? Uh, the, the minister was uh, clear that if certain sections uh, were accepted previously, uh, I would not need to move this section. Uh, have we already accepted the minister's amendments? I'll get some advice. Thank you. I understand that it's not 
I was looking for my actual phraseology, but I understand that it's not now necessary in terms of what has just gone before, okay. if that's any. That's what I'm trying to get at, yeah. so in which case, not moved. Not moved, okay. And um, the question is, therefore, that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Now, I'm going to um, stop the consideration of the, the bill here, and we will continue next week. And just suspend now for a change uh, to allow the witnesses to leave. Appointment of an EU reporter. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerks. Paragraph five, paper three, outlines the role of the reporter. And I now ask the members if there are any volunteers or nominations to um, take up this appointment. I'd like to nominate Marie Goujon. Uh, Marie Goujon nominated. Are there any other nominations? There being no further nominations, I'm very pleased to say that Mary Gujan um, is now the Justice Committee's EU reporter. <laughs> okay. Agenda item eight um, is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting on 22nd um, February 2018. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions. I refer member to paper, uh, members to paper four, which is noted by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide feedback. Uh, thank you, convener. The, the Justice Committee met last Thursday, the, the 22nd, and we took evidence from uh, uh, on Durham Constabulary's report and its investigations into Police Scotland's former counter-corruption unit. Um, we heard that evidence from the Chief Constable, Mr uh, Michael Barton, and from Daniel Ellis, the Senior Investigator of Durham Constabulary. Now, Mr uh, Barton told the subcommittee he had concerns about uh, Police Scotland changing the remit from an investigation to an inquiry and concerns about obstruction, um, particularly from the legal department, and that he expressed the view that Police Scotland was risk-averse and adopt in relation to this had adopted an unnecessarily prolonged process. Um, it's the intention of the, the subcommittee to hold further evidence um, and we'll hear on the 15th of March from Police Scotland on this particular issue. And we also took the opportunity to write to Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to seek an urgent assurance that Police Scotland will not destroy any evidence or data until the applicants have consented. This relates to the information um, underpinning much of uh, what we were discussing. Thank I'm happy you. to take any questions. Thank you. Do Thank members you. have any questions or comments? Daniel? Can I just make a, a very a brief comment? Uh, can I just say that I thought that the evidence that we took was quite extraordinary, and I think there's three key regards. First of all, 
it was refreshing to have such uh, blunt uh, and uh, straightforward evidence that we received. Uh, secondly, I think that it, there were a number of issues around prior police conduct. I think the, 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 there was the, the observation that, that evidence had simply been invented, which I think was quite extraordinary. And thirdly, I think the, 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 the conduct uh, of, of Police Scotland uh, with regard to their help or otherwise of, of the, the, the work that, that was being carried out by Durham, I think was, was quite extraordinary. For, so for those reasons, I would encourage all members who aren't member of the Police Subcommittee to really look at the official report and have a look at the evidence we took, because I thought it was very significant. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Convener. I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Daniel Johnson. I think we went in there um, with uh, the impression that the, the evidence we were going to receive uh, being quite striking. But I, I think not only what we heard, but the way in which it was presented um, was, uh, I, I think, took many of us a bit by surprise. I think future witnesses will now be judged by the um, barometer um, in terms of the, uh, the, the evidence they give. But I think there are very serious questions um, for Police Scotland in the first instance, but probably by extension SPA as well. And so um, I think, as Daniel says, it would be, uh, I think, useful for other colleagues who aren't members of that committee um, to have sight of the, the uh, responses we get from Police Scotland and SPA in due course because uh, I'm sure that will be of interest to them. Yeah, and can I just add to the, the comments then? Most concerning of all was it was an inquiry that was set about and um, it turned out to be a review at the end of the day because of police interference and clearly that wasn't acceptable. And um, I, I think to the, the fact that the complainers um, who were the very essence of, of the, the, the probe to begin with seemed to be an afterthought in how Police Scotland dealt with it is a matter of huge concern and there are um, obviously, multiple um, multiple um, areas to to um, uh, to review, to look at, and for the subcommittee to look at um, following the evidence session. John, do you want to come back and say? Y anything? Yes, it was on the particular um, expectation that the chief constable of Durham perhaps reasonably felt that the scope of what he was doing. I think it's fair to record that that's not the position of Police Scotland, nor ever has been indeed. That was the role ultimately undertaken by the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Now, I think there are issues to understand whether that is an unduly cumbersome operation, but the comments that have been made certainly in relation to risk aversion, and what I took from it was the impact that that had on the victims of what was acknowledged of illegal behaviour by Police Scotland is an aspect that we have to look at. And I think particularly the comments about the lack of cooperation from the legal department rather than, than uh, because as we know, the main people involved are no longer part of Police Scotland and we have a new regime there. But we want certainly going forward to have full and frank disclosure of all the information, not selective as we had historically. Okay, Liam McCart. I, I, think, I, I think the points that um, John Finney makes are, are entirely reasonable and the, the additional concern and, and you in a sense referenced it in terms of the, the pastoral care for, for those that um, were as, uh, uh, as um, Mike Barton suggested gravely wronged uh, by what happened. Um, I, I don't think there seem to have been any steps taken in the interim um, to engage with them, provide the, or identify what support might uh, be appropriate for them that had been left to Durham. And I think when, when we've heard um, consistently from DCC Livingston about the issue around um, police well-being being a priority and, and a concern um, laced through the Policing 2026 strategy, it's difficult to reconcile that with what we've seen in this particular uh, instance. But I, I think all of these uh, issues will have an opportunity to return to in due course. Okay, thank you for these comments which are duly noted. Formally um, close the meeting. It concludes our seventh meeting of 2018. The committee will be meeting on the 6th of March 2018 when it will continue stage two of the civil litigation bill and take evidence on alternate dispute resolutions. We now move into private session. <laughs>